Chapter 68 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 68 A Summer Ball. The same day, during the interview between Madame Danglars and the procureur, a travelling carriage entered the Rue du Helder, passed through the gateway of number 27, and stopped in the yard. In a moment, the door was opened and Madame de Morcerf alighted, leaning on her son's arm. Albert soon left her, ordered his horses, and having arranged his toilet, drove to the Champs-Élysées to the house of Monte Cristo. The Count received him with his habitual smile. It was a strange thing that no one ever appeared to advance a step in that man's favour. Those who would, as it were, force a passage to his heart, found an impassable barrier. Morcerf, who ran towards him with open arms, was chilled as he drew near, in spite of the friendly smile, and simply held out his hand. Monte Cristo shook it coldly, according to his invariable practice. "'Here I am, dear Count. Welcome home again. I arrived an hour since. From Dieppe? No, from Treport. Indeed. And I have come at once to see you. "'This is extremely kind of you,' said Monte Cristo with a tone of perfect indifference. "'And what is the news? "'You should not ask a stranger, a foreigner, for news. "'I know it, but in asking for news, I mean, have you done anything for me?' "'Had you commissioned me?' said Monte Cristo, feigning uneasiness. "'Come, come,' said Albert, "'do not assume so much indifference. "'It is said.' Sympathy travels rapidly, and when at Treport, I felt the electric shock. You have either been working for me or thinking of me. Possibly, said Monte Cristo. I have indeed thought of you, but the magnetic wire I was guiding acted indeed without my knowledge. Indeed, pray tell me how it happened. Willingly, Monsieur Danglars dined with me. I know it. To avoid meeting him, my mother and I left town. But he met here, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Your Italian prince? Not so fast. Monsieur Andrea only calls himself Count. Calls himself, do you say? Yes, calls himself. Is he not a Count? What can I know of him? He calls himself so. I, of course, give him the same title— and every one else does likewise. What a strange man you are! What next? You say Monsieur Danglars dined here? Yes, with Count Cavalcanti, the Marquis, his father, Madame Danglars, Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, charming people, a Monsieur de Bray, Maximilien Morel, and Monsieur de Chateau Renaud. Did they speak of me? Not a word. So much the worse. Why so? I thought you wished them to forget you. If they do not speak of me, I am sure they thought about me, and I am in despair. How will that affect you, since Mademoiselle Danglars was not among the number here who thought of you? Truly she might have thought of you at home. I have no fear of that. Or if she did, it was only in the same way in which I think of her. Touching sympathy! "'So you hate each other,' said the Count. "'Listen,' said Morcerf. "'If Mademoiselle Danglars were disposed to take pity on my supposed martyrdom on her account, "'and would dispense with all matrimonial formalities between our two families, "'I am ready to agree to the arrangement. "'In a word, Mademoiselle Danglars would make a charming mistress. "'But a wife, diable!' And this, said Monte Cristo, is your opinion of your intended spouse? Yes, it is rather unkind, I acknowledge, but it is true. But as this dream cannot be realized since Mademoiselle Danglars must become my lawful wife, live perpetually with me, sing to me, compose verses and music within ten paces of me, and that for my whole life it frightens me. One may forsake a mistress, but a wife, good heavens, there she must always be. 
and to marry Mademoiselle Danglars would be awful. You are difficult to please, Viscount. Yes, for I often wish for what is impossible. What is that? To find such a wife as my father found. Monte Cristo turned pale and looked at Albert while playing with some magnificent pistols. Your father was fortunate, then, said he. You know my opinion of my mother, Count. Look at her, still beautiful, witty, more charming than ever. For any other son to have stayed with his mother for four days at Treport, it would have been a condescension or a martyrdom. While I return more contented and more peaceful, shall I say more poetic, than if I had taken Queen Mab or Titania as my companion. That is an overwhelming demonstration, and you would make everyone vow to live a single life. Such are my reasons for not liking to marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Have you ever noticed how much a thing is heightened in value when we obtain possession of it? The diamond which glittered in the window at Mars or for Sands shines with much more splendor when it is our own. But if we are compelled to acknowledge the superiority of another and still must retain the one that is inferior, do you not know what we have to endure? Well, Ling, murmured the Count, thus I shall rejoice when Mademoiselle Eugénie perceives I am but a pitiful atom, with scarcely as many hundred thousand francs as she has millions. Monte Cristo smiled. One plan occurred to me, continued Albert. France likes all that is eccentric. I tried to make him fall in love with Mademoiselle Danglars, but in spite of four letters written in the most alluring style, he invariably answered, My eccentricity may be great, but it will not make me break my promise. That is what I call a devoted friendship, to recommend to another one whom you would not marry yourselves. Albert smiled. A propos, continued he, France is coming soon. "'But it will not interest you. "'You dislike him, I think.' "'I?' said Monte Cristo. "'My dear Viscount, "'how have you discovered that I did not like Monsieur France? "'I like everyone.' "'And you include me in the expression everyone? "'Many thanks.' "'Let us not mistake,' said Monte Cristo. "'I love everyone as God commands us to love our neighbour as Christians.' but I thoroughly hate but a few. Let us return to Monsieur Franz Depinay. Did you say he was coming? Yes, summoned by Monsieur de Villefort, who is apparently as anxious to get Mademoiselle Valentine married as Monsieur Donglar is to see Mademoiselle Eugénie settled. It must be a very irksome office to be the father of a grown-up daughter. It seems to make one feverish, and to raise one's pulse to ninety bits a minute until the deed is done. But Monsieur Depinay, unlike you, bears his misfortune patiently. Still more, he talks seriously about the matter, puts on a white tie, and speaks of his family. He entertains a very high opinion of Monsieur and Madame de Villefort. Which they deserve, do they not? I believe they do. Monsieur de Villefort has always passed for a severe, but a just man. There is then one, said Monte Cristo, whom you do not condemn like poor Danglars. <laughs> because I am not compelled to marry his daughter, perhaps, replied Albert, laughing. Indeed, my dear sir, said Monte Cristo, you are revoltingly foppish. I, foppish? How do you mean? Yes. Pray take a cigar, and cease to defend yourself and to struggle to escape marrying Mademoiselle Danglars. Let things take their course. Perhaps you may not have to retract. Pah, said Albert, staring. Doubtless, my dear Viscount, you will not be taken by force. And seriously, do you wish to break off your engagement? I would give a hundred thousand francs to be able to do so. Then make yourself quite easy. Monsieur Danglars would get double at some to attain the same end. Am I indeed so happy? said Albert. 
who still could not prevent an almost imperceptible cloud passing across his brow. But, my dear Count, has Monsieur Danglars any reason? Ah, there is your proud and selfish nature. You would expose the self-love of another with a hatchet, but you shrink if your own is attacked with a needle. But yet Monsieur Danglars appeared delighted with you, was he not? Well, he is a man of bad taste, and is still more enchanted with another. I know not whom. Look and judge for yourself. Thank you. I understand. But my mother... No, not my mother. A mistake. My father intends giving a ball. A ball at this season? Summer balls are fashionable. If they were not, the Countess has only to wish it, and they would become so. You are right. You know they are select affairs. Those who remain in Paris in July must be true Parisian. Will you take charge of our invitation to Messieurs Cavalcanti? When will it take place? On Saturday. Monsieur Cavalcanti's father will be gone. But the son will be here. Will you invite young Monsieur Cavalcanti? I do not know him, Viscount. You do not know him? No, I never saw him until a few days since, and am not responsible for him. But you receive him at your house. That is another thing. He was recommended to me by a good abbé, who may be deceived. Give him a direct invitation, but do not ask me to present him. If he were afterwards to marry Mademoiselle Donglard, you would accuse me of intrigue, and would be challenging me. Besides, I may not be there myself. Where? At your ball. Why should you not be there? Because you have not yet invited me. But I come expressly for that purpose. You are very kind, but I may be prevented. If I tell you one thing, you will be so amiable as to set aside all impediments. Tell me what it is. My mother begs you to come. The Comtesse de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo, starting. Ah, Count, said Albert. I assure you, Madame de Morcerf speaks freely to me, and if you have not felt those sympathetic fibres of which I spoke just now thrill within you, you must be entirely devoid of them, for during the last four days we have spoken of no one else. You have talked of me? Yes, that is the penalty of being a living puzzle. Then I am also a puzzle to your mother. I should have thought her too reasonable to be led by imagination. A problem, my dear Count, for every one, for my mother as well as others, much studied but not solved. You still remain an enigma. Do not fear. My mother is only astonished that you remain so long unsolved. I believe while the Countess G takes you for Lord Ruthven, my mother imagines you to be Cagliostro, or the Count Saint Germain, the first opportunity you have, confirm her in her opinion. It will be easy for you, as you have the philosophy of the one and the wit of the other. I thank you for the warning, said the Count. I shall endeavour to be prepared for all suppositions. You will then come on Saturday? Yes, since Madame de Morcerf invites me. You are very kind. Will Monsieur Danglars be there? He has already been invited by my father. We shall try to persuade the great D'Aguesseau, Monsieur de Villefort, to come, but have not much hope of seeing him. Never despair of anything, says the proverb. Do you dance, Count? I dance. Yes, you. It would not be astonishing. That is very well before one is over forty. No, I do not dance, but I like to see others do so. Does Madame de Morcerf dance? Never. You can talk to her. She so delights in your conversation. Indeed. Yes, truly, and I assure you, you are the only man of whom I have heard her speak with interest. Albert rose and took his hat. 
the Count conducted him to the door. "'I have one thing to reproach myself with,' said he, stopping Albert on the steps. "'What is it?' "'I have spoken to you indiscreetly about Donglars. "'On the contrary, speak to me always in the same strain about him. "'I am glad to be reassured on that point. "'A propos, when do you expect Monsieur Depinay? Five or six days hence, at the latest. "'And when is he to be married?' "'Immediately on the arrival of Monsieur and Madame de saint Meron. "'Bring him to see me. "'Although you say I do not like him, "'I assure you I shall be happy to see him. "'I will obey your orders, my lord. "'Good-bye. "'Until Saturday, when I may expect you, may I not? "'Yes, I promised you.' "'The Count watched Albert, waving his hand to him. "'When he had mounted his phaeton, Monte Cristo turned and seeing Bertuccio. What news? said he. She went to the palais, replied the steward. Did she stay long there? An hour and a half. Did she return home? Directly. Well, my dear Bertuccio, said the Count, I now advise you to go in quest of the little estate I spoke to you of in Normandy. Bertuccio bowed and as his wishes were in perfect harmony with the order he had received, he started the same evening. End of chapter 68Chapter 69. The Inquiry Monsieur de Villefort kept the promise he had made to Madame Donglars to endeavour to find out how the Count of Monte Cristo had discovered the history of the house at Auteuil. He wrote the same day for the required information to Monsieur de Beauville, who, from having been an inspector of prisons, was promoted to a high office in the police, and the latter begged for two days' time to ascertain exactly who would be most likely to give him full particulars. At the end of the second day, Monsieur de Villefort received the following note. The person called the Count of Monte Cristo is an intimate acquaintance of Lord Wilmore, a rich foreigner, who is sometimes seen in Paris and who is there at this moment. He is also known to the Abbe Boussoni, a Sicilian priest of high repute in East, where he has done much good. M. de Villefort replied by ordering the strictest inquiries to be made respecting these two persons. His orders were executed, and the following evening he received these details. The abbé, who was in Paris only for a month, inhabited a small, two-storied house behind Saint-Sulpice. There were two rooms on each floor, and he was the only tenant. The two lower rooms consisted of a dining room, with a table, chairs, and a sideboard of walnut, and a wainscoted parlour without ornaments, carpet, or timepiece. It was evident that the abbé limited himself to objects of strict necessity. He preferred to use the sitting-room upstairs, which was more library than parlour, and was furnished with theological books and parchments, in which he delighted to bury himself for months at a time, according to his valet de chambre. His valet looked at the visitors through a sort of wicket, and if their faces were unknown to him or displeased him, he replied that the abbé was not in Paris, an answer which satisfied most persons, because the abbé was known to be a great traveller. Besides, whether at home or not, whether in Paris or Cairo, the abbé always left something to give away, which the valet distributed through his wicket in his master's name. The other room near the library was a bedroom, a bed without curtains, four armchairs and a couch covered with yellow Utrecht velvet, composed with a prix jeu all its furniture. Lord Wilmore resided in Rue Fontaine Saint Georges. He was one of those English tourists who consume a large fortune in travelling. He hired the apartment in which he lived, furnished, passed only a few hours in the day there, and rarely slept there. One of his peculiarities was never to speak a word of French, which he, however, wrote with great facility. The day after this important information had been given to the king's attorney, a man alighted from a carriage at the corner of the Rue Farou, and, rapping at an olive-green door, asked if the Abbe Boussoni were within. 
No, he went out early this morning, replied the valet. I might not always be content with that answer, replied the visitor, for I come from one to whom everyone must be at home. But have the kindness to give the Abbe Busoni. I told you he was not at home, repeated the valet. Then on his return, give him that card and this sealed paper. Will he be at home at eight o'clock this evening? Doubtless, unless yet at work, which is the same as if he were out. I will come again at that time, replied the visitor, who then retired. At the appointed hour, the same man returned in the same carriage, which, instead of stopping this time at the end of the Rue Ferru, drove up to the green door. He knocked, and it opened immediately to admit him. From the signs of respect the valet paid him, he saw that his note had produced a good effect. "'Is the abbé at home?' asked he. "'Yes, he is at work in his library, but he expects you, sir,' replied the valet. The stranger ascended a rough staircase, and before a table illumined by a lamp whose light was concentrated by a large shade, while the rest of the apartment was in partial darkness, he perceived the abbé in a monk's dress, with a cowl on his head, such as is used by learned men of the Middle Ages. "'Have I the honour of addressing the Abbé Busoni? asked the visitor. "'Yes, sir,' replied the abbé. "'And you are the person whom Monsieur de Beauville, formerly an inspector of prisons, sends to me from the prefect of police?' "'Exactly, sir.' "'One of the agents appointed to secure the safety of Paris.' "'Yes, sir,' replied the stranger with a slight hesitation and blushing. The abbé replaced the large spectacles which covered not only his eyes but his temples, and sitting down motioned to his visitor to do the same. "'I am at your service, sir,' said the abbé with a marked Italian accent. "'The Michon, with which I am charged, sir,' replied the visitor, speaking with hesitation, is a confidential one on the part of him who fulfils it, and him by whom he is employed. The abbé bowed. Your probity, replied the stranger, is so well known to the prefect that he wishes as a magistrate to ascertain from you some particulars connected with the public safety to ascertain which I am deputed to see you. It is hoped that no ties of friendship or humane consideration will induce you to conceal the truth. Provided, sir, the particulars you wish for do not interfere with my scruples or my conscience. I am a priest, sir, and the secrets of confession, for instance, must remain between me and God, and not between me and human justice. Do not alarm yourself, monsieur. We will duly respect your conscience. At this moment, the abbé pressed down his side of the shade and so raised it on the other, throwing a bright light on the stranger's face, while his own remained obscured. Excuse me, abbé, said the envoy of the prefect of the police, but the light tries my eyes very much. The abbé lowered the shade. "'Now, sir, I am listening. Go on. "'I will come at once to the point. "'Do you know the Count of Monte Cristo?' "'You mean Monsieur Zacon, I presume?' "'Zacon? Is not his name Monte Cristo?' "'Monte Cristo is the name of an estate, or rather of a rock, and not a family name.' "'Well, be it so.' Let us not dispute about words. And since Monsieur de Monte Cristo and Monsieur Zacon are the same, absolutely the same, let us speak of Monsieur Zacon. Agreed. I asked you if you knew him. Extremely well. Who is he? The son of a rich shipbuilder in Malta. I know that is a report, but as you are aware, no police does not content itself with vague reports. However, replied the abbé with an affable smile, 
when that report is in accordance with the truth. Everybody must believe it, the police as well as all the rest. Are you sure of what you assert? What do you mean by that question? Understand, sir, I do not in the least suspect your veracity. I ask if you are certain of it. I knew his father, Monsieur Zacon. Ah, indeed. And when a child, I often played with the son in the timber yards. But whence does he derive the title of Count? You are aware that may be bought. In Italy? Everywhere. And his immense riches, whence does he procure them? They may not be so very great. How much do you suppose he possesses? From one hundred and fifty to hundred thousand livres per annum? That is reasonable, said the visitor. I have heard he had three or four million. Two hundred thousand per annum would make four millions of capital. But I was told he had four million per annum. That is not probable. Do you know this island of Monte Cristo? Certainly. Everyone who has come from Palermo, Napoli or Roma to France by sea must know it since he has passed close to it and must have seen it. I am told it is a delightful place. It is a rock. And why has the Count bought a rock? For the sake of being a Count. In Italy, one must have territorial possessions to be a Count. You have doubtless heard the adventures of Monsieur Zacan's youth. The father's? No, the son's. I know nothing certain. At that period of his life I lost sight of my young comrade. Was he in the wars? I think he entered the service. In what branch? In the navy. Are you not his confessor? No, sir, I believe he is a Lutheran. A Lutheran. I say I believe such is the case. I do not affirm it. Besides, liberty of conscience is established in France. Doubtless, and we are not now inquiring into his creed, but his actions, in the name of the Prefect of Police. I ask you what you know of him. He passes for a very charitable man. Our Holy Father, the Pope, has made him a knight of Jesus Christ for the services he rendered to the Christians in the East. He has five or six rings as testimonials from Eastern monarchs of his services. Does he wear them? No, but he is proud of them. He is better pleased with rewards given to the benefactors of man than to his destroyers. He is a Quaker, then. Exactly, he is a Quaker, with the exception of the peculiar dress. Has he any friends? Yes, everyone who knows him is his friend. But has he any enemies? One only. What is his name? Lord Wilmore. Where is he? He is in Paris just now. Can he give me any particulars? Important ones. He was in India with Zacon. Do you know his abode? It's somewhere in the Chaussée d'Antin, but I know neither the street nor the number. Are you at variance with the Englishman? I love Zacon, and he hates him. We are consequently not friends. Do you think the Count of Monte Cristo had ever been in France before he made his visit to Paris? To that question I can answer positively no. He had not, because he applied to me six months ago for the particulars he required, and as I did not know when I might again come to Paris, I recommended Monsieur Cavalcanti to him. Andrea? No, Bartolomeo, his father. Now, sir, I have but one question more to ask, and I charge you in the name of honour, of humanity and of religion, to answer me candidly. What is it, sir? Do you know with what design Monsieur de Monte Cristo 
purchased a house at Auteuil. Certainly, for he told me. What is it, sir? To make a lunatic asylum of it, similar to that founded by the Count of Pisani at Palermo. Do you know about that institution? I have heard of it. It is a magnificent charity. Having said this, the abbe bowed to imply he wished to pursue his studies. The visitor either understood the abbe's meaning, or had no more questions to ask. He arose, and the abbe accompanied him to the door. "'You are a great almsgiver,' said the visitor, "'and although you are said to be rich, I will venture to offer you something for your poor people. Will you accept my offering?' "'I thank you, sir. I am only jealous in one thing, and that is that the relief I give should be entirely from my own resources. However, my resolution, sir, is unchangeable, but you have only to search for yourself, and you will find, alas, but too many objects upon whom to exercise your benevolence. The abbe once more bowed as he opened the door. The stranger bowed and took his leave and the carriage conveyed him straight to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. An hour afterwards the carriage was again ordered, and this time it went to the Rue Fontaine-Saint-Georges, and stopped at number five where Lord Wilmore lived. The stranger had written to Lord Wilmore, requesting an interview which the latter had fixed for ten o'clock. As the envoy of the Prefect of Police arrived ten minutes before ten, he was told that Lord Wilmore, who was precision and punctuality personified, was not yet come in, but that he should be sure to return as the clock struck. The visitor was introduced into the drawing-room, which was like all other furnished drawing-rooms, a mantelpiece with two modern Sèvres vases, a timepiece representing Cupid with his bent bow, a mirror with an engraving on each side, one representing Homer carrying his guide, the other Belisarius begging, a greyish paper, red and black tapestry, such was the appearance of Lord Wilmore's drawing-room. It was illuminated by lamps with ground-glass shades which gave only a feeble light, as if out of consideration for the envoy's weak sight. After ten minutes' expectation the clock struck ten. At the fifth stroke the door opened, and Lord Wilmore appeared. He was rather above the middle height, with thin reddish whiskers, light complexion and light hair, turning rather grey. He was dressed with all the English peculiarity, namely in a blue coat with gilt buttons and high collar in the fashion of 1811, a white kerseymere waistcoat and nankeen pantaloons, three inches too short, but which were prevented by straps from slipping up to the knee. His first remark on entering was, "'Are you new, sir?' I do not speak French. I know you do not like to converse in our language, replied the envoy. But you may use it, replied Lord Wilmore. I understand it. And I, replied the visitor, changing his idiom, know enough of English to keep up the conversation. Do not put yourself to the slightest inconvenience. Oh, said Lord Wilmore, with that tone which is only known to natives of Great Britain. The envoy presented his letter of introduction, which the latter read with English coolness, and having finished, "'I understand,' said he, "'perfectly.' Then began the questions, which were similar to those which had been addressed to the Abbe Bussoni. But as Lord Wilmore, in the character of the Count's enemy, was less restrained in his answers, they were more numerous— he described the youth of Monte Cristo, who he said at ten years of age entered the service of one of the petty sovereigns of India who made war on the English. It was there Wilmore had first met him and fought against him, and in that war Zekon had been taken prisoner, sent to England, and consigned to the hulks, whence he had escaped by swimming. Then began his travels, his duels, his caprice, then the insurrection in Greece broke out, and he had served in the Grecian ranks. While in that service he had discovered a silver mine in the mountains of Thessaly, but he had been careful to conceal it from everyone. After the Battle of Navarino, when the Greek government was consolidated, 
he asked of King Otho a mining grant for that district, which was given him. Hence that immense fortune which, in Lord Wilmore's opinion, possibly amounted to one or two millions per annum, a precarious fortune which might be momentarily lost by the failure of the mine. But, asked the visitor, do you know why he came to France? He is speculating in railways, said Lord Wilmore, and as he is an expert chemist and physicist, he has invented a new system of telegraphy, which he is seeking to bring to perfection. How much does he spend a yearly? asked the prefect. Not more than five or six hundred thousand francs, said Lord Wilmore. She is a miser. Hatred evidently inspired the Englishman, who, knowing no other reproach to bring on the Count, accused him of avarice. Do you know his house at Auteuil? Certainly. What do you know respecting it? Do you wish to know why he bought it? Yes. The Count is a speculator, who will certainly ruin himself in experiments. He supposes there is in the neighbourhood of the house he has bought a mineral spring equal to those at Bannière Luchon Cateret. He is going to turn his house into a bath house, as the Germans term it. He's already dug up all the garden two or three times to find the famous spring, and being unsuccessful, he will soon purchase all the contiguous houses. Now, as I dislike him and hope his railway, his electric telegraph, or his search for baths will ruin him, I am watching for his discomfiture, which must soon take place. What was the cause of your quarrel? When he was in England, he seduced the wife of one of my friends. Why do you not seek revenge? I have already fought three duels with him, said the Englishman, the first with the pistol, the second with the sword, and the third with the sabre. And what was the result of those duels? The first time he broke my arm, the second he wounded me in the breast, and the third time made this large wound. The Englishman turned down his shirt collar and showed a scar whose redness proved it to be a recent one. So that, you see, there is a deadly feud between us. But, said the envoy, you do not go about it in the right way to kill him, if I understand you correctly. Oh, said the Englishman, I practice shooting every day, and every other day Grisier comes to my house. This was all the visitor wished to ascertain, or rather all the Englishman appeared to know. The agent arose, and having bowed to Lord Wilmore, who returned his salutation with the stiff politeness of the English, he retired. Lord Wilmore, having heard the door close after him, returned to his bedroom, where with one hand he pulled off his light hair, his red whiskers, his false jaw, and his wound, to resume the black hair, dark complexion, and pearly teeth of the Count of Monte Cristo. It was Monsieur de Villefort, and not the prefect, who returned to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. The procureur felt more at ease, although he had learned nothing really satisfactory. And for the first time since the dinner party at Auteuil, he slept soundly. End of chapter 69《チャプター70》《ヴァカント・モンテ・クリスト》by Alexandre Dumas。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 70 The Ball It was in the warmest days of July when, in due course of time, the Saturday arrived upon which the ball was to take place at Monsieur de Morcerf's. It was ten o'clock at night. The branches of the great trees in the garden of the Count's house. Stood out boldly against the azure canopy of heaven, which was studded with golden stars, but where the last fleeting clouds of a vanishing storm yet lingered. From the apartments on the ground floor might be heard the sound of music, with the whirl of the waltz and gallop, while brilliant streams of light shone through the openings of the Venetian blinds. 
At this moment, the garden was only occupied by about ten servants who had just received orders from their mistress to prepare the supper. The serenity of the weather continuing to increase, until now it had been undecided whether the supper should take place in the dining room or under a long tent erected on the lawn, but the beautiful blue sky, studded with stars, had settled the question in favour of the lawn. The gardens were illuminated with coloured lanterns, according to the Italian custom, and, as is usual in countries where the luxuries of the table, the rarest of all luxuries in their complete form, are well understood, the supper table was loaded with wax lights and flowers. At the time, the Countess of Morcerf returned to the rooms, after giving her orders, many guests were arriving, more attracted by the charming hospitality of the Countess than by the distinguished position of the Count, for, owing to the good taste of Mercedes, one was sure of finding some devices at her entertainment worthy of describing, or even copying in case of need. Madame Danglars, in whom the events we have related had caused deep anxiety, had hesitated about going to Madame de Morcerf's, when, during the morning, her carriage happened to meet that of Villefort, the latter made a sign, and when the carriages had drawn close together, said, "'You are going to Madame de Morcerf's, are you not?' "'No,' replied Madame Longlard. "'I am too ill.' "'You are wrong,' replied Villefort, significantly. "'It is important that you should be seen there.' "'Do you think so?' asked the baroness. "'I do.' "'In that case, I will go.' "'And the two carriages passed on towards their different destinations. "'Madame Danglars therefore came, not only beautiful in person, "'but radiant with splendour. "'She entered by one door at the time when Mercedes appeared at the door. "'The countess took Albert to meet Madame Danglars. "'He approached, paid her some well-merited compliments on her toilet, "'and offered his arm to conduct her to her seat. "'Albert looked around him. "'You are looking for my daughter.' said the baroness, smiling. "'I confess it,' replied Albert. "'Could you have been so cruel as not to bring her?' "'Calm yourself. She has met Mademoiselle de Villefort, and has taken her arm. See, they are following us, both in white dresses, one with a bouquet of camellias, the other with one of Miosotis. "'But tell me—' "'Well, what do you wish to know?' Will not the Count of Monte Cristo be here tonight? Seventeen, replied Albert. What do you mean? I only mean that the Count seems the rage, replied the Viscount, smiling, and that you are the seventeenth person that has asked me the same question. The Count is in fashion. I congratulate him upon it. And have you replied to everyone as you have to me? Ah, to be sure, I have not answered you. Be satisfied. We shall have this lion. We are among the privileged ones. Were you at the opera yesterday? No. He was there. Ah, indeed. And did, did the eccentric person commit any new originality? Can he be seen without doing so? Else there was dancing in the Diable Boiteux. The Greek princess was in ecstasies. After the cachucha, he placed a magnificent ring on the stem of a bouquet and threw it to the charming dancers, who in the third act, to do honour to the gift, reappeared with it on her finger. And the Greek princess, will she be here? No, you will be deprived of that pleasure. Her position in the Count's establishment is not sufficiently understood. Wait, leave me here and go and speak to Madame de Villefort, who is trying to attract your attention. Albert bowed to Madame Danglars and advanced towards Madame de Villefort, whose lips opened as he approached. I wager anything, said Albert, interrupting her, that I know what you are about to say. Well, what is it? If I guess rightly, will you confess it? Yes. On your honour? On my honour. You were going to ask me if the Count of Monte Cristo had arrived or was expected. Not at all. It is not of him that I am now thinking. 
I was going to ask you if you had received any news of Monsieur Franz. Yes, yesterday. What did he tell you? That he was leaving at the same time as his letter. Well, now then, the Count? The Count will come, of that you may be satisfied. You know that he has another name besides Monte Cristo. No, I did not know it. Monte Cristo is the name of an island, and he has a family name. I never heard it. Well, then, I am better informed than you. His name is Zacon. It is possible. He is Maltese. That is also possible. The son of a shipowner. Really, you should relate all this aloud. You would have the greatest success. He served in India, discovered a mine in Thessaly, and comes to Paris to establish a mineral water cure at Auteuil. Well, I am sure, said Morcerf, this is indeed news. Am I allowed to repeat it? Yes, but cautiously. Tell one thing at a time, and do not say I told you. Why so? Because it is a secret just discovered. By whom? The police. Then the news originated at the prefect's last night. Paris, you can understand, is astonished at the sight of such unusual splendor, and the police have made inquiries. Well, well, nothing more is wanting than to arrest the Count as a vagabond on the pretext of his being too rich. Indeed, that doubtless would have happened if his credentials had not been so favorable. Poor Count! And is he aware of the danger he has been in? I think not. Then it will be but charitable to inform him when he arrives. I will not fail to do so. Just then, a handsome young man with bright eyes, black hair, and glossy moustache respectfully bowed to Madame de Villefort. Albert extended his hand. Madame, said Albert, allow me to present to you Monsieur Maximilian Morel, captain of Spahi, one of our best, and above all of our bravest officers. I have already had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman at Auteuil, at the house of the Count of Monte Cristo, replied Madame de Villefort, turning away with marked coldness of manner. This answer, and especially the tone in which it was uttered, chilled the heart of poor Morel. But a recompense was in store for him. Turning around, he saw near the door a beautiful fair face, whose large blue eyes were, without any marked expression, fixed upon him, while the bouquet of myosotis was gently raised to her lips. The salutation was so well understood that Morel, with the same expression in his eyes, placed his handkerchief to his mouth, and these two living statues, whose hearts beat so violently under their marble aspect, separated from each other by the whole length of the room, forgot themselves for a moment, or rather forgot the world in their mutual contemplation. They might have remained much longer lost in one another without any one noticing their abstraction. The Count of Monte Cristo had just entered. We have already said that there was something in the Count which attracted universal attention wherever he appeared. It was not the coat, unexceptional in its cut, though simple and unornamented. It was not the plain white waistcoat. It was not the trousers that displayed the foot so perfectly formed. It was none of these things that attracted the attention. It was his pale complexion, his waving black hair, his calm and serene expression, his dark and melancholy eye, his mouth, chiselled with such marvellous delicacy, which so easily expressed such high disdain. These were what fixed the attention of all upon him. Many men might have been handsomer, but certainly there could be none whose appearance was more significant, if the expression may be used. Everything about the Count seemed to have its meaning, for the constant habit of thought which he had acquired had given an ease and vigour to the expression of his face, and even to the most trifling gesture, scarcely to be understood. Yet the Parisian world is so strange, 
that even all this might not have won attention had there not been connected with it a mysterious story gilded by an immense fortune. Meanwhile, he advanced through the assemblage of guests under a battery of curious glances towards Madame de Morcerf, who, standing before a mantelpiece ornamented with flowers, had seen his entrance in a looking-glass placed opposite the door, and was prepared to receive him. She turned towards him with a serene smile just at the moment he was bowing to her. No doubt she fancied the Count would speak to her, while on his side the Count thought she was about to address him. But both remained silent, and after a mere bow, Monte Cristo directed his steps to Albert, who received him cordially. "'Have you seen my mother?' asked Albert. "'I have just had the pleasure,' replied the Count. "'But I have not seen your father.' See, he is down there, talking politics with that little group of great geniuses. Indeed, said Monte Cristo, and so those gentlemen down there are men of great talent. I should not have guessed it, and for what kind of talent are they celebrated? You know there are different sorts. The tall, arch-looking man is very learned. He discovered in the neighborhood of Rome a kind of lizard, with a vertebra more than lizards usually have and he immediately laid his discovery before the Institute. The thing was discussed for a long time, but finally decided in his favour. I can assure you the vertebra made a great noise in the learned world, and the gentleman, who was only a knight of the Legion of Honour, was made an officer. Come, said Monte Cristo, this cross seems to me to be wisely awarded. I suppose, had he found another additional vertebra, they would have made him a commander. Very likely, said Albert. And who can that person be who has taken it in his head to wrap himself up in a blue coat embroidered with green? Oh, that coat is not his own. It is the Republic's which deputed David to devise a uniform for the academicians. Indeed, said Monte Cristo. So this gentleman is an academician. Within the last week he has been made one of the learned assembly. And what is his special talent? His talent, I believe, he thrusts pins through the heads of rabbits. He makes fowls eat madder and punches the spinal marrow out of dogs with whalebone. And he is made a member of the Academy of Sciences for this? No, of the French Academy. But what has the French Academy to do with all this? I was going to tell you, it seems, that his experiments have very considerably advanced the cause of science, doubtless. No, that his style of writing is very good. This must be very flattering to the feelings of the rabbits, into whose heads he has thrust pins, to the fowls whose bones he has dyed red, and to the dogs whose spinal marrow he has punched out. Albert laughed. And the other one? demanded the Count. That one? Yes, the third. The one in the dark blue coat? Yes. He is a colleague of the Count, and one of the most active opponents to the idea of providing the Chamber of Peers with a uniform. He was very successful upon that question. He stood badly with the liberal papers, but his noble opposition to the wishes of the court is now getting him into favour with the journalists. They talk of making him an ambassador. And what are his claims to the peerage? He has composed two or three comic operas, written four or five articles in the siècle, and voted five or six years on the ministerial side. Bravo, Viscount, said Monte Cristo, smiling. You are a delightful Cicerone, and now you will do me a favour, will you not? What is it? Do not introduce me to any of these gentlemen, and should they wish it, you will warn me. Just then the Count felt his arm pressed. He turned round. It was Danglars. Ah, is it you, Baron? said he. Why do you call me Baron? said Danglars. You know that I care nothing for my title, 
I am not like you, Viscount. You like your title, do you not? Certainly, replied Albert, seeing that without my title I should be nothing, while you, sacrificing the baron, would still remain the millionaire. Which seems to me the finest title under the royalty of July, replied Donglar. Unfortunately, said Monte Cristo, one's title to a millionaire does not last for life, like that of baron, peer of France, or academician, for example, the millionaires Frank and Pullman of Frankfurt, who have just become bankrupts. Indeed, said Donglar, becoming pale. Yes, I received the news this evening by a courier. I had about a million in their hands, but warned in time, I withdrew it a month ago. Ah, mon Dieu! exclaimed Donglar. They have drawn on me for two hundred thousand francs. Well, you can throw out the draft. Their signature is worth five per cent. Yes, but it is too late, said Donglar. I have honoured their bills. Then, said Monte Cristo, here are two hundred thousand francs gone after... Hush! Do not mention these things, said Donglar. Then, approaching Monte Cristo, he added, Especially before young Monsieur Cavalcanti. After which he smiled and turned towards the young man in question. Albert had left the Count to speak to his mother, Donglar to converse with young Cavalcanti. Monte Cristo was for an instant alone. Meanwhile, the heat became excessive. The footmen were hastening through rooms with waiters loaded with ices. Monte Cristo wiped the perspiration from his forehead, but drew back when the waiter was presented to him. He took no refreshment. Madame de Morcerf did not lose sight of Monte Cristo. She saw that he took nothing, and even noticed his gesture of refusal. Albert, she asked, did you notice that? What, mother? That the Count has never been willing to partake of food under the roof of Monsieur de Morcerf. Yes, but then he breakfasted with me. Indeed, he made his first appearance in the world on that occasion. But your house is not Monsieur de Morcerf's, murmured Mercedes. And since he has been here, I have watched him. Well? Well, he has taken nothing yet. The Count is very temperate. Mercedes smiled sadly. Approach him, said she, and when the next waiter passes, insist upon his taking something. But why, mother? Just to please me, Albert, said Mercedes. Albert kissed his mother's hand and drew near the Count. Another salver passed, loaded like the preceding ones. She saw Albert attempt to persuade the Count, but he obstinately refused. Albert rejoined his mother. She was very pale. Well, said she, you see he refuses. Yes, but why need this annoy you? You know, Albert, women are singular creatures. I should like to have seen the Count take something in my house, if only an ice. Perhaps he cannot reconcile himself to the French style of living, and might prefer something else. Oh, no, I have seen him eat of everything in Italy. No doubt he does not feel inclined this evening. And besides, said the Countess, accustomed as he is to burning climates, possibly he does not feel the heat as we do. I do not think that, for he has complained of feeling almost suffocated, and asked why the Venetian blinds were not opened as well as the windows. In a word, said Mercedes, it was a way of assuring me that his abstinence was intended. And she left the room. A minute afterwards the blinds were thrown open, and through the jessamine and clematis that overhung the window one could see the garden ornamented with lanterns, and the supper laid under the tent. Dancers, players, talkers, all uttered an exclamation of joy. Every one inhaled with delight the breeze that floated in. At the same time, Mercedes reappeared paler than before, but with that imperturbable expression of countenance which she sometimes wore. She went straight to the group of which her husband formed the centre. "'Do not detain this gentleman here, Count,' said she. "'They would prefer 
I should think, to breathe in the garden rather than suffocate here, since they are not playing. Ah, said a gallant old general who in 1809 had sung Partan pour la Syrie, we will not go alone to the garden. Then, said Mercedes, I will lead the way. Turning towards Monte Cristo, she added, Count, will you oblige me with your arm? The Count almost staggered at these simple words, then he fixed his eyes on Mercedes. It was only a momentary glance, but it seemed to the Countess to have lasted for a century. So much was expressed in that one look. He offered his arm to the Countess. She took it, or rather just touched it with her little hand, and they together descended the steps, lined with rhododendrons and camellias. Behind them, by another outlet, a group of about twenty persons rushed into the garden with loud exclamations of delight. End of chapter 70《Chapter 71 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 71 Bread and Salt. Madame de Morcerf entered an archway of trees with her companion. It led through a grove of lindens to a conservatory. It was too warm in the room, was it not, Count? she asked. "'Yes, madame, and it was an excellent idea of yours to open the doors and the blinds.' As he ceased speaking, the Count felt the hand of Mercedes tremble. "'But you,' he said, "'with that light dress and without anything to cover you but that gauze scarf, perhaps you feel cold.' "'Do you know where I am leading you?' said the Countess, without replying to the question. "'No, madame,' replied Monte Cristo. "'But you see, I make no resistance.' "'We are going to the greenhouse that you see at the other end of the grove.' The Count looked at Mercedes as if to interrogate her, but she continued to walk on in silence, and he refrained from speaking. They reached a building ornamented with magnificent fruits, which ripen at the beginning of July in the artificial temperature which takes the place of the sun, so frequently absent in our climate. The Countess left the arm of Monte Cristo and gathered a bunch of Muscatel grapes. "'See, si, Count,' she said with a smile so sad in its expression that one could almost detect the tears on her eyelids. "'See, si, our French grapes are not to be compared, I know, with yours of Sicily and Cyprus. But you will make allowance for our northern sun.' The Count bowed but stepped back. "'Do you refuse?' said Mercedes in a tremulous voice. "'Pray excuse me, madame,' replied Monte Cristo. "'But I never eat muscatel grapes.' Mercedes let them fall and sighed. A magnificent peach was hanging against an adjoining wall, ripened by the same artificial heat. Mercedes drew near and plucked the fruit. "'Take this peach, then.' she said. The Count again refused. "'What? Again?' she exclaimed, in so plaintive an accent that it seemed to stifle a sob. "'Really? You pain me!' A long silence followed. The peach, like the grapes, fell to the ground. "'Count,' added Mercedes with a supplicating glance, "'there is a beautiful Arabian custom which makes eternal friends of those who have eaten together bread and salt under the same roof. I know it, madame, replied the Count. But we are in France and not in Arabia, and in France eternal friendships are as rare as the custom of dividing bread and salt with one another. But, said the Countess breathlessly with her eyes fixed on Monte Cristo, whose arm she convulsively pressed with both hands, we... Our friends, are we not? The Count became pale as death. The blood rushed to his heart, and then again rising, dyed his cheeks with crimson. His eyes swam like those of a man suddenly dazzled. 
Certainly, we are friends, he replied. Why should we not be? The answer was so little like the one Mercedes desired that she turned away to give vent to a sigh, which sounded more like a groan. Thank you, she said, and they walked on again. They went the whole length of the garden without uttering a word. Sir, suddenly exclaimed the Countess, after their walk had continued ten minutes in silence, is it true that you have seen so much, travelled so far, and suffered so deeply? I have suffered deeply, madame, answered Monte Cristo. But now you are happy? Doubtless, replied the Count, since no one hears me complain. And your present happiness, has it softened your heart? My present happiness equals my past misery, said the Count. Are you not married? asked the Countess. I married? exclaimed Monte Cristo, shuddering. Who could have told you so? No one told me you were, but you have frequently been seen at the opera with a young and lovely woman. She is a slave whom I bought at Constantinople, madame, the daughter of a prince. I have adopted her as my daughter, having no one else to love in the world. You live alone, then? I do. You have no sister, no son, no father? I have no one. How can you exist thus, without anyone to attach you to life? It is not my fault, madame. At Malta I loved a young girl, was on the point of marrying her, when war came and carried me away. I thought she loved me well enough to wait for me, and even to remain faithful to my memory. When I returned, she was married. This is the history of most men who have passed twenty years of age. Perhaps my heart was weaker than the hearts of most men, and I suffered more than they could have done in my place. That is all. The Countess stopped for a moment, as if gasping for breath. Yes, she said. And you have still preserved this love in your heart. One can only love once. And did you ever see her again? Never. Never? I never returned to the country where she lived. To Malta? Yes, Malta. She is then now at Malta? I think so. And have you forgiven her for all she has made you suffer? Her, yes, but only her. Do you then still hate those who separated you? I hate them? Not at all. Why should I? The Countess placed herself before Monte Cristo, still holding in her hand a portion of the perfumed grapes. Take some, she said. Madam, I never eat muscatel grapes, replied Monte Cristo as if the subject had not been mentioned before. The Countess dashed the grapes into the nearest thicket with a gesture of despair. Inflexible man, she murmured. Monte Cristo remained as unmoved as if the reproach had not been addressed to him. Albert at this moment ran in. Oh, mother, he exclaimed, such a misfortune has happened. What? What has happened? asked the Countess, as though awakening from a sleep to the realities of life. Did you say a misfortune? Indeed, I should expect misfortunes. Monsieur de Villefort is here. Well? He comes to fetch his wife and daughter. Why so? Because Madame de saint Meran has just arrived in Paris, bringing the news of Monsieur de saint Meran's death, which took place on the first stage after he left Marseille. Madame de Villefort, who was in very good spirits, would neither believe nor think of the misfortune, but Mademoiselle Valentine, at the first words, guessed the whole truth, notwithstanding all the precautions of her father. The blow struck her like a thunderbolt, and she fell senseless. And how was Monsieur de saint Meran related to Mademoiselle de Villefort? said the Count. He was her grandfather on the mother's side. 
He was coming here to hasten our marriage with France. Ah, indeed. So France must wait. Why was not Monsieur de saint Meron also grandfather to Mademoiselle d'Anglard? Albert, Albert, said Madame de Morcerf in a tone of mild reproof. What are you saying? Ah, oh, Count, he esteems you so highly. Tell him that he has spoken amiss. And she took two or three steps forward. Monte Cristo watched her with an air so thoughtful and so full of affectionate admiration that she turned back and grasped his hand. At the same time she seized that of her son and joined them together. "'We are friends, are we not?' she asked. "'Oh, madame, I do not presume to call myself your friend, but at all times I am your most respectful servant.' The countess left with an indescribable pang in her heart, and before she had taken ten steps, the count saw her raise her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Do not my mother and you agree?' asked Albert, astonished. "'On the contrary,' replied the count. "'Did you not hear her declare that we were friends?' They re-entered the drawing-room which Valentine and Madame de Villefort had just quitted, it is perhaps needless to add that Morel departed almost at the same time. End of chapter 71Madame de Saint-Méran A gloomy scene had indeed just passed at the house of Monsieur de Villefort. After the ladies had departed for the ball, whither all the entreaties of Madame de Villefort had failed in persuading him to accompany them, the procureur had shut himself up in his study, according to his custom, with a heap of papers calculated to alarm anyone else, but which generally scarcely satisfied his inordinate desires. But this time the papers were a mere matter of form. Villefort had secluded himself, not to study, but to reflect. And with the door locked and orders given that he should not be disturbed excepting for important business, he sat down in his armchair and began to ponder over the events, the remembrance of which had during the last eight days filled his mind with so many gloomy thoughts and bitter recollections. Then, instead of plunging into the mass of documents piled before him, he opened the drawer of his desk, touched a spring, and drew out a parcel of cherished memoranda, amongst which he had carefully arranged, in characters only known to himself, the names of all those who either in his political career, in money matters, at the bar, or in his mysterious love affairs, had become his enemies. Their number was formidable. Now that he had begun to fear, and yet these names, powerful though they were, had often caused him to smile with the same kind of satisfaction experienced by a traveller who from the summit of a mountain beholds at his feet the craggy eminences, the almost impassable paths, and the fearful chasms through which he has so perilously climbed. When he had run over all those names in his memory, again read and studied them, commenting meanwhile upon his lists, he shook his head. No, he murmured. None of my enemies would have waited so patiently and laboriously for so long a space of time that they might now come and crush me with this secret. Sometimes, as Hamlet says, foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. But, like a phosphoric light, they rise but to mislead. The story has been told by the Corsican to some priest, who in his turn has repeated it. Monsieur de Monte Cristo may have heard it, and to enlighten himself. But why should he wish to enlighten himself upon the subject? asked Villefort, after a moment's reflection. What interest can this Monsieur de Monte Cristo, or Monsieur Zaccone, son of a shipowner of Malta, discover of a mine in Thessaly, now visiting Paris for the first time? What interest, I say, can he take in discovering 
a gloomy, mysterious, and useless fact like this. However, among all the incoherent details given to me by the Abbe Bussoni, and by Lord Wilmore, by that friend and that enemy, one thing appears certain and clear in my opinion, that in no period, in no case, in no circumstance, could there have been any contact between him and me. But Villefort uttered words which even he himself did not believe. He dreaded not so much the revelation, for he could reply to or deny its truth. He cared little for that mean, tickle, upharsin, which appeared suddenly in letters of blood upon the wall. But what he was really anxious for was to discover whose hand had traced them. While he was endeavouring to calm his fears, and instead of dwelling upon the political future that had so often been the subject of his ambitious dreams, was imagining a future limited to the enjoyments of home, in fear of awakening the enemy that had so long slept. The noise of a carriage sounded in the yard. Then he heard the steps of an aged person ascending the stairs, followed by tears and lamentations, such as servants always give vent to when they wish to appear interested in their master's grief. He drew back the bolt of his door, and almost directly an old lady entered, unannounced, carrying her shawl on her arm and her bonnet in her hand. The white hair was thrown back from her yellow forehead, and her eyes, already sunken by the furrows of age, now almost disappeared beneath the eyelids, swollen with grief. "'Oh, sir,' she said, "'oh, sir, what a misfortune! I shall die of it! Oh, yes, I shall certainly die of it!' And then, falling upon the chair nearest the door, she burst into a paroxysm of sobs. The servants standing in the doorway, not daring to approach, Nero were looking at Noirtier's old servant, who had heard the noise from his master's room, and run there also, remaining behind the others. Villefort rose and ran towards his mother-in-law, for it was she. "'Why, what can have happened?' he exclaimed. "'What has thus disturbed you? Is Monsieur de Saint-Méran with you?' "'Monsieur de Saint-Méran is dead,' answered the old marchioness, without preface and without expression. She appeared to be stupefied. Villefort drew back, and clasping his hands together, exclaimed, "'Dead? So suddenly?' "'A week ago,' continued Madame de saint Maron, "'we went out together in the carriage after dinner. Monsieur de saint Maron had been unwell for some days. Still, the idea of seeing our dear Valentine again inspired him with courage, and notwithstanding his illness, he would leave. At six leagues from Marseilles, after having eaten some of the lozenge he is accustomed to take, he fell into such a deep sleep that it appeared to me unnatural. Still, I hesitated to wake him, although I fancied that his face was flushed and that the veins of his temple throbbed more violently than usual. However, as it became dark and I could no longer see, I fell asleep. I was soon aroused by a piercing shriek as from a person suffering in his dreams, and he suddenly threw his head back violently. I called the valet. I stopped the postilion. I spoke to Monsieur de saint Meran. I applied my smelling salts. But all was over, and I arrived at Aix by the side of a corpse. Villefort stood with his mouth half open, quite stupefied. Of course you sent for a doctor? Immediately. But as I have told you, it was too late. Yes, but then he could tell of what complaint the poor Marquis had died. Oh, yes, sir. He told me. It appears to have been an apoplectic stroke. And what did you do then? Monsieur de saint Meran had always expressed a desire, in case his death happened during his absence from Paris, that his body might be brought to the family vault. I had him put into a leaden coffin, and I am preceding him by a few days. Oh, my poor mother, 
said Villefort, to have such duties to perform at your age after such a blow. God has supported me through all. And then, my dear Marquis, he would certainly have done everything for me that I perform for him. It is true that since I left him, I seem to have lost my senses. I cannot cry. At my age, they say, that we have no more tears. Still, I think that when one is in trouble, one should have the power of weeping. Where is Valentine, sir? It is on her account I am here. I wish to see Valentine. Villefort thought it would be terrible to reply that Valentine was at a ball, so he only said that she had gone out with her stepmother, and that she should be fetched. This instant, sir, this instant, I beseech you, said the old lady. Villefort placed the arm of Madame de saint Meron within his own, and conducted her to his apartment. "'Rest yourself, mother,' he said. The marchioness raised her head at this word, and beholding the man who so forcibly reminded her of her deeply regretted child, who still lived for her in Valentine, she felt touched at the name of mother, and bursting into tears, she fell on her knees before an armchair where she buried her venerable head. Villefort left her to the care of the women, while old Barois ran half scared to his master, for nothing frightens old people so much as when death relaxes its vigilance over them for a moment in order to strike some other old person. Then, while Madame de saint Meron remained on her knees, praying fervently, Villefort sent for a cab and went himself to fetch his wife and daughter from Madame de Morcerf's. He was so pale when he appeared at the door of the ballroom that Valentine ran to him, saying, "'Oh, father, some misfortune has happened.' "'Your grandmamma has just arrived, Valentine,' said Monsieur de Villefort. "'And grandpapa?' inquired the young girl, trembling with apprehension. Monsieur de Villefort only replied by offering his arm to his daughter. It was just in time for Valentine's head swam and she staggered. Madame de Villefort instantly hastened to her assistance and aided her husband in dragging her to the carriage, saying, "'What a singular event! Who could have thought it? Ah, yes, it is indeed strange!' And the wretched family departed, leaving a cloud of sadness hanging over the rest of the evening. At the foot of the stairs... Valentine found Barois awaiting her. "'Monsieur Noirtier wishes to see you tonight,' he said in an undertone. "'Tell him I will come when I leave my dear grandmamma,' she replied, feeling with true delicacy that the person to whom she could be of the most service just then was Madame de saint Meron. Valentine found her grandmother in bed, silent caresses, heart-wrung sobs, broken sighs, burning tears were all that passed in this sad interview, while Madame de Villefort, leaning on her husband's arm, maintained all outward forms of respect, at least towards the poor widow. She soon whispered to her husband, "'I think it would be better for me to retire with your permission, for the sight of me appears still to afflict your mother-in-law,' Madame de saint Meron heard her. "'Yes, yes,' she said softly to Valentine. Let her leave. But do you stay? Madame de Villefort left, and Valentine remained alone beside the bed, for the procureur, overcome with astonishment at the unexpected death, had followed his wife. Meanwhile, Marois had returned for the first time to old Nartier, who, having heard the noise in the house, had, as we have said, sent his old servant to inquire the cause. On his return, his quick, intelligent eye interrogated the messenger. "'Alas, sir!' exclaimed Barois. "'A great misfortune has happened. "'Madame de saint Meron has arrived, and her husband is dead.' Monsieur de saint Meron and Noirtier had never been on strict terms of friendship. Still, the death of one old man always considerably affects another. Noirtier let his head fall upon his chest, apparently overwhelmed and thoughtful. Then he closed one eye, in token of inquiry. Mademoiselle Valentine? 
Noirtier nodded his head. She is at the ball, as you know, since she came to say goodbye to you in full dress. Noirtier again closed his left eye. Do you wish to see her? Noirtier again made an affirmative sign. Well, they have gone to fetch her, no doubt, from Madame de Morcerf's. I will await her return and beg her to come up here. Is that what you wish for? Yes, replied the invalid. Parois, therefore, as we have seen, watched for Valentine and informed her of her grandfather's wish. Consequently, Valentine came up to Noirtier on leaving Madame de saint Meron, who, in the midst of her grief, had at last yielded to fatigue and fallen into a feverish sleep. Within reach of her hand, they placed a small table upon which stood a bottle of orangeade, her usual beverage, and a glass. Then, as we have said, the young girl left the bedside to see Monsieur Noirtier. Valentine kissed the old man, who looked at her with such tenderness that her eyes again filled with tears, whose sources he thought must be exhausted. The old gentleman continued to dwell upon her with the same expression. "'Yes, yes,' said Valentine. "'You mean that I have yet a kind grandfather left, do you not?' The old man intimated that such was his meaning. "'Ah, yes, happily I have,' replied Valentine. "'Without that, what would become of me?' It was one o'clock in the morning. Barrois, who wished to go to bed himself, observed that after such sad events everyone stood in need of rest. Noirtier would not say that the only rest he needed was to see his child, but wished her a good night, for grief and fatigue had made her appear quite ill. The next morning she found her grandmother in bed. The fever had not abated. On the contrary, her eyes glistened and she appeared to be suffering from violent nervous irritability. "'Oh, dear grandmamma, are you worse?' exclaimed Valentine, perceiving all these signs of agitation. "'No, my child, no,' said Madame de saint Meron. "'But I was impatiently waiting for your arrival, that I might send for your father.' "'My father?' inquired Valentine uneasily. "'Yes, I wish to speak to him.' Valentine durst not oppose her grandmother's wish, the cause of which she did not know, and an instant afterwards Villefort entered. "'Sir,' said Madame de saint Meron, without using any circumlocution, and as if fearing she had no time to lose, "'he wrote to me concerning the marriage of this child.' "'Yes, madame,' replied Villefort. "'It is not only projected, but arranged.' "'Your intended son-in-law is named Monsieur Franz d'Epinay.' Yes, madame. Is he not the son of General d'Epinay, who was under our side and was assassinated some days before the usurper returned from the island of Elba? The same. Does he not dislike the idea of marrying the granddaughter of a Jacobin? Our civil dissensions are now happily extinguished, mother, said Villefort. Monsieur d'Epinay was quite a child when his father died. He knows very little of Monsieur Noirtier, and will meet him, if not with pleasure, at least with indifference. Is it a suitable match? In every respect. And the young man? Is regarded with universal esteem. You approve of him? He is one of the most well-bred young men I know. During the whole of this conversation, Valentine had remained silent. "'Well, sir,' said Madame de saint Meron, after a few minutes' reflection, "'I must hasten the marriage, for I have but a short time to live.' "'You, madame, you, dear mamma," exclaimed Monsieur de Villefort and Valentine at the same time. "'I know what I am saying,' continued the marchioness. "'I must hurry you, so that, as she has no mother,' She may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage. I am all that is left to her belonging to my poor René, whom you have so soon forgotten, sir. Oh, madame, said Villefort, you forget that I was obliged to give a mother to my child. A stepmother, 
is never our mother, sir. But this is not to the purpose. Our business concerns Valentine. Let us leave the dead in peace. All this was said with such exceeding rapidity that there was something in the conversation that seemed like the beginning of delirium. It shall be as you wish, madame, said Villefort. More especially since your wishes coincide with mine. And as soon as Monsieur d'Epinay arrives in Paris... My dear grandmother, interrupted Valentine, consider decorum, the recent death. You would not have me marry under such sad auspices. My child, exclaimed the old lady sharply, let us hear none of the conventional objections that deter weak minds from preparing for the future. I also was married at the deathbed of my mother, and certainly I have not been less happy on that account. Still, that idea of death, madame, said Villefort. Still, always, I tell you I am going to die. Do you understand? Well, before dying, I wish to see my son-in-law. I wish to tell him to make my child happy. I wish to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me. In fact, I will know him, I will, continued the old lady with a fearful expression, that I may rise from the depths of my grave to find him, if he should not fulfil his duty. Madame, said Villefort, you must lay aside these exalted ideas, which almost assume the appearance of madness. The dead, once buried in their graves, rise no more. And I tell you, sir, that you are mistaken. This night I have had a fearful sleep. It seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body. My eyes, which I tried to open, closed against my will. And what will appear impossible above all to you, sir, I saw, with my eyes shut, in the spot where you are now standing, issuing from that corner where there is a door leading into Madame Villefort's dressing room, I saw, I tell you, silently enter a white figure. Valentine screamed. It was a fever that disturbed you, madame, said Villefort. Doubt, if you please, but I am sure of what I say. I saw a white figure, and as if to prevent my discrediting the testimony of only one of my senses, I heard my glass removed, the same which is there now on the table. Oh, dear mother, it was a dream. So little was it a dream that I stretched my hand toward the bell. But when I did so, the shed disappeared. My maid then entered with a light. But she saw no one. Phantoms are visible to those only who ought to see them. It was the soul of my husband. Well, if my husband's soul can come to me. Why should not my soul appear to guard my granddaughter? The tie is even more direct, it seems to me. Oh, madame, said Villefort, deeply affected in spite of himself, do not yield to these gloomy thoughts. You will long live with us, happy, loved and honoured, and we will make you forget. Never, 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 said the marchioness. When does Monsieur Depinay return? We expect him every moment. It is well. As soon as he arrives, inform me. We must be expeditious. And then I also wish to see a notary, that I may be assured that all our property returns to Valentine. Oh, Grandmama, murmured Valentine, pressing her lips on the burning brow. Do you wish to kill me? Oh, how feverish you are! We must not send for a notary, but for a doctor. A doctor, said she, shrugging her shoulders. I am not ill. I am thirsty, that is all. What are you drinking, dear grandmamma? The same as usual, my dear. My glass is there on the table. Give it to me, Valentine. Valentine poured the orangeade into a glass and gave it to her grandmother with a certain degree of dread for it was the same glass she fancied that had been touched by the spectre. The marchioness drained the glass at a single draught, and then turned on her pillow, repeating, "'The notary! 
the notary. Monsieur de Villefort left the room, and Valentine seated herself at the bedside of her grandmother. The poor child appeared herself to require the doctor she had recommended to her aged relative. A bright spot burned in either cheek. Her respiration was short and difficult, and her pulse beat with feverish excitement. She was thinking of the despair of Maximilian when he should be informed that Madame de saint Meron, instead of being an ally, was unconsciously acting as his enemy. More than once she thought of revealing all to her grandmother, and she would not have hesitated a moment if Maximilien Morel had been named Albert de Morcerf or Raoul de Chateaurenaud. But Morel was of plebeian extraction, and Valentine knew how the haughty Marquise de saint Meron despised all who were not noble. Her secret had each time been repressed when she was about to reveal it, by the sad conviction that it would be useless to do so, for were it once discovered by her father and mother, all would be lost. Two hours passed thus. Madame de saint Meron was in a feverish sleep, and the notary had arrived. Though his coming was announced in a very low tone, Madame de saint Meron arose from her pillow. "'The notary!' she exclaimed. Let him come in. The notary, who was at the door, immediately entered. Go, Valentine, said Madame de saint Meron, and leave me with this gentleman. But, Grandmama, leave me, go. The young girl kissed her grandmother and left with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the door she found the valet de chambre, who told her that the doctor was waiting in the dining room. Valentine instantly ran down. The doctor was a friend of the family and at the same time one of the cleverest men of the day, and very fond of Valentine, whose birth he had witnessed. He had himself a daughter about her age, but whose life was one continued source of anxiety and fear to him from her mother having been consumptive. "'Oh,' said Valentine, "'we have been waiting for you with such impatience, dear Monsieur d'Avigny. But first of all, how are Madeleine and Antoinette?' Madeleine was the daughter of Monsieur d'Avrigny, and Antoinette his niece. Monsieur d'Avrigny smiled sadly. "'Antoinette is very well,' he said. "'And Madeleine tolerably so. Uh, "'But you send for me, my dear child. "'It is not your father or Madame de Villefort who is ill.' "'As for you, although we doctors cannot divest our patients of nerves, "'I fancy you have no further need of me "'than to recommend you not to allow your imagination to take too wide a field. Valentine coloured. Monsieur d'Avrigny carried the science of divination almost to a miraculous extent, for he was one of the physicians who always work upon the body through the mind. No, she replied. It is for my dear grandmother. You know the calamity that has happened to us, do you not? I know nothing, said Monsieur d'Avrigny. Alas, said Valentine, restraining her tears, my grandfather is dead. Monsieur de saint Meron? Yes. Suddenly? From an apoplectic stroke. An apoplectic stroke? repeated the doctor. Yes, and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband, whom she never left, has called her and that she must go and join him. Oh, Monsieur d'Avrigny, I beseech you, do something for her. Where is she? In her room with the notary. And Monsieur Noitier? Just as he was, his mind perfectly clear, but the same incapability of moving or speaking. And the same love for you, eh, my dear child? Yes, said Valentine. He was very fond of me. Who does not love you? Valentine smiled sadly. "'What are your grandmother's symptoms?' "'An extreme nervous excitement and a strangely agitated sleep. "'She fancied this morning in her sleep "'that her soul was hovering above her body, "'which she at the same time watched. "'It must have been delirium. "'She fancies, too, that she saw a phantom enter her chamber "'and even heard the noise it made on touching her glass.' "'It is singular,' said the doctor. I was not aware that Madame Saint-Marin was subject to such hallucinations. 
It is the first time I've ever saw her in this condition, said Valentine. And this morning she frightened me so that I thought her mad. And my father, who you know is a strong-minded man, himself appeared deeply impressed. We will go and see, said the doctor. What you tell me seems very strange. The notary here descended, and Valentine was informed that her grandmother was alone. Go upstairs, she said to the doctor. And you? Oh, I dare not. She forbade me sending for you, and, as you say, I am myself agitated, feverish, and out of sorts. I will go and take a turn in the garden to recover myself. The doctor pressed Valentine's hand, and while he visited her grandmother she descended the steps. We need not say which portion of the garden was her favourite walk. After remaining for a short time in the parterre surrounding the house, and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair, she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench. Then from the bench she went to the gate. As usual Valentine strolled for a short time among her flowers, but without gathering them. The mourning in her heart forbade her assuming this simple ornament, though she had not yet had time to put on the outward semblance of woe. She then turned towards the avenue. As she advanced, she fancied she heard a voice speaking her name. She stopped, astonished. Then the voice reached her ear more distinctly, and she recognized it to be that of Maximilian. End of chapter 72《Chapter 73 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 73 The Promise. It was indeed Maximilien Morel who had passed a wretched existence since the previous day. With the instinct peculiar to lovers, he had anticipated after the return of Madame de Saint Meran and the death of the Marquis that something would occur at M. de Villefort's in connection with his attachment for Valentine. His presentiments were realised, as we shall see, and his uneasy forebodings had goaded him pale and trembling to the gate under the chestnut trees. Valentine was ignorant of the cause of this sorrow and anxiety, and as it was not his accustomed hour for visiting her, she had gone to the spot simply by accident, or perhaps through sympathy. Morel called her, and she ran to the gate. "'You are here at this hour,' said she. "'Yes, my poor girl,' replied Morel. "'I come to bring and to hear bad tidings.' "'This is indeed a house of mourning,' said Valentine. "'Speak, Maximilien, although the cup of sorrow seems already full.' "'Dear Valentine,' said Morel, endeavouring to conceal his own emotion. "'Listen, I entreat you, what I am about to say is very serious. When are you to be married? I will tell you all, said Valentine. From you I have nothing to conceal. This morning the subject was introduced, and my dear grandmother, on whom I have depended as my only support, not only declared herself favourable to it, but is so anxious for it that they only await the arrival of Monsieur d'Epinay, and the following day the contract will be signed. A deep sigh escaped the young man, who gazed long and mournfully at her he loved. Alas, replied he, it is dreadful thus to hear my condemnation from your own lips. The sentence is passed, and in a few hours will be executed. It must be so, and I will not endeavour to prevent it. But since you say nothing remains but for Monsieur de Pinay to arrive, that the contract may be signed, and the following day you will be his. Tomorrow you will be engaged to Monsieur d'Epinay, for he came this morning to Paris. Oh! Valentine uttered a cry. I was at the house of Monte Cristo an hour since, said Morel. We were speaking, he of the sorrow your family had experienced, and I of your grief. When a carriage rolled into the courtyard, Never till then 
had I placed any confidence in presentiments, but now I cannot help believing them. At the sound of that carriage I shuddered. Soon I heard steps on the staircase, which terrified me as much as the footsteps of the commander did Don Juan. The door at last opened. Albert de Morcerf entered first, and I began to hope my fears were vain, when after him another young man advanced, and the Count exclaimed, Ah, here is the Baron Franz d'Epinay. I summoned all my strength and courage to my support. Perhaps I turned pale and trembled, but certainly I smiled, and five minutes after I left, without having heard one word that had passed. Poor Maximilien, murmured Valentine. Valentine, the time has arrived when you must answer me. And remember, my life depends on your answer. What do you intend doing? Valentine held down her head. She was overwhelmed. Listen, said Morel, it is not the first time you have contemplated our present position, which is a serious and urgent one. I do not think it is a moment to give way to useless sorrow. Leave that for those who like to suffer at their leisure and indulge their grief in secret. There are such in the world, and God will doubtless reward them in heaven for their resignation on earth. But those who mean to contend must not lose one precious moment, but first return immediately the blow which fortune strikes. Do you intend to struggle against our ill fortune? Tell me, Valentine, for it is that I came to know. Valentine trembled and looked at him with amazement. The idea of resisting her father, her grandmother, and all the family had never occurred to her. What do you say, Maximilien? asked Valentine. What do you mean by a struggle? Oh, it would be sacrilege. What? I resist my father's order and my dying grandmother's wish? Impossible! Morel started. You are too noble not to understand me, and you understand me so well that you already yield, dear Maximilien. No, no, I shall need all my strength to struggle with myself and support my grief in secret, as you say. But to grieve my father, to disturb my grandfather's last moments, never. You are right, said Morel calmly. In what a tone you speak, cried Valentine. I speak as one who admires you, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle, cried Valentine. Mademoiselle? Oh, selfish man! He sees me in despair and pretends he cannot understand me. You mistake. I understand you perfectly. You will not oppose Monsieur Villefort. You will not displease the Marchioness, and tomorrow you will sign the contract which will bind you to your husband. But, mon Dieu, tell me, how can I do otherwise? Do not appeal to me, mademoiselle. I shall be a bad judge in such a case. My selfishness will bind me, replied Morel whose low voice and clinched hands announced his growing desperation. What would you have proposed, Maximilian? Had you found me willing to accede? It is not for me to say. You are wrong. You must advise me what to do. Do you seriously ask my advice, Valentine? Certainly, dear Maximilian, for if it is good, I will follow it. You know my devotion to you. Valentine, said Morel, pushing aside a loose plank, give me your hand in token of forgiveness of my anger. My senses are confused, and during the last hour the most extravagant thoughts have passed through my brain. Oh, if you refuse my advice! What do you advise? said Valentine, raising her eyes to heaven and sighing. I am free said Maximilian, and rich enough to support you. I swear to make you my lawful wife before my lips even shall have approached your forehead. You make me tremble, said the young girl. Follow me, said Morel. I will take you to my sister, who is worthy also to be yours. 
We will embark for Algiers, for England, for America, or, if you prefer it, retire to the country and only return to Paris when our friends have reconciled your family. Valentine shook her head. I feared it, Maximilien, said she. It is the counsel of a madman. And I should be more mad than you, did I not stop you at once with the word impossible, impossible. You will then submit to what fate decrees for you, without even attempting to contend with it, said Morel sorrowfully. Yes, if I die. Well, Valentine, resumed Maximilian, I can only say again that you are right. Truly it is I who am mad, and you prove to me that passion blinds the most well-meaning. I appreciate your calm reasoning. It is then understood that tomorrow you will be irrevocably promised to Monsieur Franz de Pinay, not only by that theatrical formality invented to heighten the effect of a comedy called The Signature of the Contract. But your own will? Again, you drive me to despair, Maximilian, said Valentine. Again, you plunge the dagger into the wound. What would you do, tell me, if your sister listened to such a proposition? Mademoiselle, replied Morel with a bitter smile, I am selfish. You have already said so. And as a selfish man, I think not of what others would do in my situation, but of what I intend doing myself. I think only that I have known you not a whole year. From the day I first saw you, all my hopes of happiness have been in securing your affection. One day you acknowledged that you loved me, and since that day my hope of future happiness has rested on obtaining you, for to gain you would be life to me. Now I think no more. I say only that fortune has turned against me. I had thought to gain heaven, and now I have lost it. It is an everyday occurrence for a gambler to lose not only what he possesses, but also what he has not. Morel pronounced these words with perfect calmness. Valentine looked at him a moment with her large, scrutinizing eyes, endeavoring not to let Morel discover the grief which struggled in her heart. But, in our world, what are you going to do? asked she. I am going to have the honor of taking my leave of you, mademoiselle, solemnly assuring you that I wish your life may be so calm, so happy, and so full occupied, that there may be no place for me, even in your memory. Oh, murmured Valentine. Adieu, Valentine. Adieu, said Morel, bowing. Where are you going? cried the young girl, extending a hand through the opening and seizing Maximilian by his coat, for she understood from her own agitated feelings that her lover's calmness could not be real. Where are you going? I am going that I may not bring fresh trouble into your family, and to set an example which every honest and devoted man, situated as I am, may follow. Before you leave me, Tell me what you are going to do, Maximilian. The young man smiled sorrowfully. Speak, speak, said Valentine. I entreat you. Has your resolution changed, Valentine? It cannot change, unhappy man. You know it must not, cried the young girl. Then adieu, Valentine. Valentine shook the gate with a strength of which she could not have been supposed to be possessed, as Morel was going away, and passing both her hands through the opening, she clasped and wrung them. "'I must know what you mean to do,' she said. "'Where are you going?' "'Oh, fear not,' said Maximilian, stopping at a short distance. "'I do not intend to render another man responsible for the rigorous fate reserved for me.' Another might threaten to seek Monsieur Franz, to provoke him and to fight with him. All oh, that would be folly. What has Monsieur Franz to do with it? He saw me this morning for the first time, 
and has already forgotten he has seen me. He did not even know I existed when it was arranged by your two families that you should be united. I have no enmity against Monsieur Franz, and promise you the punishment shall not fall on him. On whom, then? On me? On you? Valentine! Oh, heaven forbid! Woman is sacred. The woman one loves is holy. On yourself, then, unhappy man! On yourself? I am the only guilty person, am I not? said Maximilian. Maximilian! said Valentine. Maximilian! Come back, I entreat you! He drew near with his sweet smile, and but for his paleness one might have thought him in his usual happy mood. Listen, my dear, my adored Valentine, said he in his melodious and grave tone. Those who, like us, have never had a thought for which we need blush before the world, such may read each other's hearts. I never was romantic, and am no melancholy hero. I imitate neither Manfred nor Antony, but without words, protestations, or vows, my life has entwined itself with yours. You leave me, and you are right in doing so. I repeat it, you are right, but in losing you, I lose my life. The moment you leave me, Valentine, I am alone in the world. My sister is happily married, her husband is only my brother-in-law, that is, a man whom the ties of social life alone attach to me. No one then longer needs my useless life. This is what I shall do. I will wait until the very moment you are married, for I will not lose the shadow of one of those unexpected chances which are sometimes reserved for us, since Monsieur Franz may, after all, die before that time. A thunderbolt may fall even on the altar as you approach. Nothing appears impossible to one condemned to die, and miracles appear quite reasonable when his escape from death is concerned. I will, then, wait until the last moment, and when my misery is certain, irremediable, hopeless, I will write a confidential letter to my brother-in-law, another to the prefect of police, to acquaint them with my intention, and at the corner of some wood, on the brink of some abyss, on the bank of some river, I will put an end to my existence, as certainly as I am the son of the most honest man who ever lived in France. Valentine trembled convulsively. She loosened her hold of the gate. Her arms fell by her side, and two large tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man stood before her, sorrowful and resolute. "'Oh, for pity's sake!' said she. "'You will live, will you not?' "'No, on my honour, said Maximilian. "'But that will not affect you. "'You have done your duty, and your conscience will be at rest.' "'Valentine fell on her knees, and pressed her almost bursting heart. "'Maximilian!' said she. "'Maximilian, my friend, my brother on earth, my true husband in heaven, I entreat you, do as I do, live in suffering. Perhaps one day we may be united.' "'Adieu, Valentine,' repeated Morel. "'My God,' said Valentine, raising both her hands to heaven with a sublime expression, I have done my utmost to remain our submissive daughter. I have begged, entreated, implored. He has regarded neither my prayers, my entreaties, nor my tears. It is done, cried she, willing away her tears and resuming her firmness. I am resolved not to die of remorse, but rather of shame. Live, Maximilian, and I will be yours. Say when shall it be? Speak, command, I will obey. Morel, who had already gone some few steps away, again returned, and pale with joy, extended both hands towards Valentine through the opening. Valentine, 
said he. Dear Valentine, you must not speak thus. Rather let me die. Why should I obtain you by violence if our love is mutual? Is it from mere humanity you bid me live? I would rather die. Truly, murmured Valentine, who on this earth cares for me if he does not? Who has consoled me in my sorrow but he? On whom do my hopes rest? On whom does my bleeding heart repose? On him, on him, always on him. Yes, you are right, Maximilian. I will follow you. I will leave the paternal home. I will give up all. Oh, ungrateful girl that I am, cried Valentine, sobbing. I will give up all, even my dear old grandfather, whom I had nearly forgotten. No, said Maximilian. You shall not leave him. Monsieur Noirtier has evinced, you say, a kind feeling towards me. Well, before you leave, tell him all. His consent would be your justification in God's sight. As soon as we are married, he shall come and live with us. Instead of one child, he shall have two. You have told me how you talk to him and how he answers you. I shall very soon learn that language by signs. Valentine, I promise you solemnly that instead of despair, it is happiness that awaits us. Oh, see, Maximilian, see the power you have over me. You almost make me believe you, and yet what you tell me is madness, for my father will curse me. He is inflexible. He will never pardon me. Now listen to me, Maximilian. If by artifice, by entreaty, by accident, in short, if by any means I can delay this marriage, will you wait? Yes, I promise you. As faithfully as you have promised me, that this horrible marriage shall not take place, and that if you are dragged before a magistrate or a priest, you will refuse. I promise you, by all that is most sacred to me in the world, namely, by my mother. We will wait, then, said Morel. Yes, we will wait, replied Valentine, who revived at these words. There are so many things which may save unhappy beings such as we are. I rely on you, Valentine, said Morel. All you do will be well done, only if they disregard your prayers. If your father and Madame de saint Maron insist that Monsieur de Depinay should be called tomorrow to sign the contract, then you have my promise, Maximilian. Instead of signing, I will go to you and we will fly. But from this moment until then, let us not tempt Providence. Let us not see each other. It is a miracle. It is a Providence that we have not been discovered. If we were surprised, if it were known that we met thus, we should have no further resource. You are right, Valentine. But how shall I ascertain? From the notary, Monsieur Deschamps, I know him. And for myself, I will write to you. Depend on me. I dread this marriage, Maximilian, as much as you. Thank you, my adored Valentine. Thank you. That is enough. When once I know the hour, I will hasten to this spot. You can easily get over this fence with my assistance. A carriage will await us at the gate, in which you will accompany me to my sister's. There... Living, retired, or mingling in society, as you wish, we shall be unable to use our power to resist oppression and not suffer ourselves to be put to death like sheep, which only defend themselves by sighs. Yes, said Valentine. I will now acknowledge you are right, Maximilian. And now are you satisfied with your betrothal? said the young girl sorrowfully. My adored Valentine. Words cannot express one half of my satisfaction. Valentine had approached, or rather had placed her lips so near the fence that they nearly touched those of Morel, which were pressed against the other side of the cold and inexorable barrier. Adieu, until we meet again, said Valentine, tearing herself away. I shall hear from you? 
Yes. Thanks, thanks, dear love. Adieu. The sound of a kiss was heard, and Valentine fled through the avenue. Morel listened to catch the last sound of her dress brushing the branches, and of her footstep on the gravel, then raised his eyes with an ineffable smile of thankfulness to heaven for being permitted to be thus loved, and then also disappeared. The young man returned home and waited all the evening, and all the next day without getting any message. It was only on the following day, at about ten o'clock in the morning, as he was starting to call on Monsieur Deschamps, the notary, that he received from the postman a small billet, which he knew to be from Valentine, although he had not before seen her writing. It was to this effect. Tears, entreaties, prayers have availed me nothing. Yesterday for two hours I was at the church of Saint-Philippe de Roule, and for two hours I prayed most fervently. Heaven is as inflexible as man, and the signature of the contract is fixed for this evening at nine o'clock. I have but one promise, and but one art to give. That promise is pledged to you. That art is also yours. This evening, then, at a quarter to nine, at the gate, your betrothed, Valentine de Villefort, P.S. My poor grandmother gets worse and worse. Yesterday, a fever amounted to delirium. Today, a delirium is almost madness. You'll be very kind to me, will you not, Morel, to make me forget my sorrow in leaving her thus? I think it is kept a secret from Grandpapa Noirtier that the contract is to be signed this evening. Morel went also to the notary, who confirmed the news that the contract was to be signed that evening. Then he went to call on Monte Cristo, and heard still more. France had been to announce the ceremony, and Madame de Villefort had also written to beg the Count to excuse her not inviting him. The death of Monsieur de saint Meron and the dangerous illness of his widow would cast a gloom over the meeting which she would regret should be shared by the Count, whom she wished every happiness. The day before France had been presented to Madame de saint Meron, who had left her bed to receive him, but had been obliged to return to it immediately after. It is easy to suppose that Morel's agitation would not escape the Count's penetrating eye. Monte Cristo was more affectionate than ever. Indeed, his manner was so kind that several times Morel was on the point of telling him all. But he recalled the promise he had made to Valentine, and kept his secret. The young man read Valentine's letter twenty times in the course of the day. It was her first, and on what an occasion! Each time he read it, he renewed his vow to make her happy. How great is the power of a woman who has made so courageous a resolution! What devotion does she deserve from him for whom she has sacrificed everything? How ought she really to be supremely loved? She becomes at once a queen and a wife, and it is impossible to thank and love her sufficiently. Borel longed intensely for the moment when he should hear Valentine say, Here I am, Maximilian. Come and help me. He had arranged everything for her escape. Two ladders were hidden in the clover field. A cabriolet was ordered for Maximilian alone without a servant, without lights. At the turning of the first street, they would light the lamps, as it would be foolish to attract the notice of the police by too many precautions. Occasionally he shuddered, he thought of the moment when, from the top of that wall, he should protect the descent of his dear Valentine, pressing in his arms for the first time her, of whom he had yet only kissed the delicate hand. When the afternoon arrived, and he felt that the hour was drawing near, he wished for solitude. His agitation was extreme. A simple question from a friend would have irritated him. He shut himself in his room and tried to read but his eye glanced over the page without understanding a word, and he threw away the book, and for the second time sat down to sketch his plan, the ladders and the fence. At length the hour drew near. Never did a man deeply in love allow the clocks to go on peacefully. Morel tormented his so effectually that they struck eight at half-past six. He then said, 
It is time to start. The signature was indeed fixed to take place at nine o'clock. But perhaps Valentine will not wait for that. Consequently, Morel, having left the Rue Melee at half past eight by his timepiece, entered the clover field, while the clock of Saint Philippe du Roule was striking eight. The horse and cabriolet were concealed behind a small ruin where Morel had often waited. The night gradually drew on, and the foliage in the garden assumed a deeper hue. Then Morel came out from his hiding place with a beating heart and looked through the small opening in the gate. There was yet no one to be seen. The clock struck half past eight, and still another half hour was passed in waiting, while Morel walked to and fro and gazed more and more frequently through the opening. The garden became darker still, but in the darkness he looked in vain for the white dress, and in the silence he vainly listened for the sound of footsteps. The house, which was discernible through the trees, remained in darkness and gave no indication that so important an event as the signature of a marriage contract was going on. Morel looked at his watch, which wanted a quarter to ten. But soon, the same clock he had already heard strike two or three times rectified the error by striking half-past nine. This was already half an hour past the time Valentine had fixed. It was a terrible moment for the young man. The slightest rustling of the foliage, the least whistling of the wind attracted his attention and drew the perspiration to his brow. Then he tremblingly fixed his ladder and, not to lose a moment, placed his foot on the first step. Amidst all these alternations of hope and fear, the clock struck ten. It is impossible, said Maximilian, that the signing of a contract should occupy so long a time without unexpected interruptions. I have weighed all the chances, calculated the time required for all the forms. Something must have happened. And then he walked rapidly to and fro and pressed his burning forehead against the fence. Had Valentine fainted? Or had she been discovered and stopped in her flight? These were the only obstacles which appeared possible to the young man. The idea that her strength had failed her in attempting to escape, and that she had fainted in one of the paths, was the one that most impressed itself upon his mind. "'In that case,' said he, "'I should lose her, and by my own fault.' He dwelt on this idea for a moment. Then it appeared reality. He even thought he could perceive something on the ground at a distance. He ventured to call, and it seemed to him that the wind wafted back an almost inarticulate sigh. At last the half-hour struck. It was impossible to wait longer. His temples throbbed violently. His eyes were growing dim. He passed one leg over the wall, and in a moment leapt down on the other side. He was on Villefort's premises, had arrived there by scaling the wall. What might be the consequences? However, he had not ventured thus far to draw back. He followed a short distance close under the wall, then crossed a path, hid, entered a clump of trees. In a moment, he had passed through them and could see the house distinctly. Then Morel saw that he had been right in believing that the house was not illuminated. Instead of lights at every window, as is customary on days of ceremony, he saw only a grey mass, which was veiled also by a cloud, which at that moment obscured the moon's feeble light. A light moved rapidly from time to time past three windows of the second floor. These three windows were in Madame de saint Meran's room. Another remained motionless behind some red curtains which were in Madame de Villefort's bedroom. Morel guessed all this. So many times, in order to follow Valentine in thought at every hour in the day, had he made her describe the whole house, that without having seen it, he knew it all. This darkness and silence alarmed Morel still more than Valentine's absence had done. Almost mad with grief, and determined to venture everything in order to see Valentine once more, and be certain of the misfortune he feared, Morel gained the edge of the clump of trees and was going to pass as quickly as possible through the flower garden, when the sound of a voice, still at some distance, but which was borne upon the wind, reached him. 
At this sound, as he was already partially exposed to view, he stepped back and concealed himself completely, remaining perfectly motionless. He had formed his resolution. If it was Valentine alone, he would speak as she passed. If she was accompanied and he could not speak, still he should see her and know that she was safe. If they were strangers, he would listen to their conversation and might understand something of this hitherto incomprehensible mystery. The moon had just then escaped from behind the cloud which had concealed it, and Morel saw Villefort come out upon the steps, followed by a gentleman in black. They descended and advanced towards the clump of trees, and Morel soon recognized the other gentleman as Dr. Davrigny. The young man, seeing them approach, drew back mechanically until he found himself stopped by a sycamore tree in the centre of the clump. There he was compelled to remain. Soon the two gentlemen stopped also. "'Ah, my dear doctor,' said the procureur, "'heaven declares itself against my house. What a dreadful death! What a blow! Seek not to console me. Alas, nothing can alleviate so great a sorrow.' The wound is too deep and too fresh. Dead! Dead! The cold sweat sprang to the young man's brow, and his teeth chattered. Who could be dead in that house, which Villefort himself had called accursed? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor with a tone which redoubled the terror of the young man, I have not led you here to console you. On the contrary. What can you mean? asked the procureur, alarmed. "'I mean that behind the misfortune which has just happened to you, there is another, perhaps still greater.' "'Can it be possible?' murmured Villefort, clasping his hands. "'What are you going to tell me?' "'Are we quite alone, my friend?' "'Yes, quite. But why all these precautions?' "'Because I have a terrible secret to communicate to you,' said the doctor." Let us sit down. Villefort fell rather than seated himself. The doctor stood before him with one hand placed on his shoulder. Morel, horrified, supported his head with one hand and with the other pressed his heart lest its beating should be heard. Dead, dead, repeated he within himself, and he felt as if he were also dying. Speak, doctor, I am listening, said Villefort. Strike! I am prepared for everything. Madame de Saint Méran was doubtless advancing in years, but she enjoyed excellent health. Morel began again to breathe freely, which she had not done during the last ten minutes. Grief has consumed her, said Villefort. Yes, grief, doctor. After living forty years with the Marquis. It is not grief, my dear Villefort, said the doctor. Grief may kill, although it rarely does, and never in a day, never in an hour, never in ten minutes. Villefort answered nothing. He simply raised his head, which had been cast down before, and looked at the doctor with amazement. "'Were you present during the last struggle?' asked Monsieur de Davrigny. "'I was,' replied the procureur. "'You begged me not to leave.' Did you notice the symptoms of the disease to which Madame de Saint Méran has fallen a victim? I did. Madame de Saint Méran had three successive attacks at intervals of some minutes, each one more serious than the former. When you arrived, Madame de Saint Méran had already been panting for breath some minutes. She then had a fit, which I took to be simply a nervous attack, and it was only when I saw her raise herself in the bed and her limbs and neck appeared stiffened, that I became really alarmed. Then I understood from your countenance there was more to fear than I had thought. This crisis passed. I endeavoured to catch your eye, but could not. You held her hand. You were feeling her pulse, and the second fit came on before you had turned towards me. This was more terrible than the first. The same nervous movements were repeated, and the mouth contracted and turned purple. And at the third, she expired. 
At the end of the first attack, I discovered symptoms of tetanus. You confirm my opinion. Yes, before others, replied the doctor. But now we are alone. What are you going to say? Oh, spare me. That the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances are the same. Monsieur de Villefort started from his seat, then in a moment fell down again silent and motionless. Morel knew not if he were dreaming or awake. Listen, said the doctor. I know the full importance of the statement I have just made, and the disposition of the man to whom I have made it. Do you speak to me as a magistrate or as a friend? asked Villefort. As a friend, and only as a friend at this moment. The similarity in the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances is so great that were I obliged to affirm by oath what I have now stated, I should hesitate. I therefore repeat to you, I speak not to a magistrate, but to a friend. And to that friend I say, during the three quarters of an hour that the struggle continued, I watched the convulsions and the death of Madame de saint Meron and am thoroughly convinced that not only did her death proceed from poison, but I could also specify the poison. Can it be possible? The symptoms are marked, do you see? Sleep, broken by nervous spasms, excitation of the brain, topper of the nerve centers. Madame de saint Meron succumbed to a powerful dose of brucine or of strychnine, which by some mistake, perhaps, has been given to her. Villefort seized the doctor's hand. Oh, it, it is impossible, said he. I must be dreaming. It is frightful to hear such things from such a man as you. Tell me, I entreat you, my dear doctor, that you may be deceived. Doubtless I may, but... But? But I do not think so. Have pity on me, doctor. So many dreadful things have happened to me lately that I am on the verge of a madness. Has anyone besides me seen Madame de saint Meron? No. Has anything been sent for from a chemist that I have not examined? Nothing. Had Madame de saint Meron any enemies? Not to my knowledge. Would her death affect anyone's interest? It could not indeed. My daughter is her only heiress, Valentine alone. Oh, if such a thought could present itself, I would stab myself to punish my heart for having for one instant harboured it. Indeed, my dear friend, said Monsieur d'Avigny, I would not accuse any one. I speak only of an accident, you understand? Of a mistake. But whether accident or mistake, the fact is there. It is on my conscience and compels me to speak aloud to you. Make inquiry. Of whom? How? Of what? May not Barrois, the old servant, have made a mistake and have given Madame de saint Meron a dose prepared for his master? For my father? Yes. But how could a dose prepared for Monsieur Noirtier poison Madame de saint Meron? Nothing is more simple. You know poisons become remedies in certain diseases of which paralysis is one. For instance, having tried every other remedy to restore movement and speech to Monsieur Noirtier, I resolved to try one last means, and for three months I have been giving him brucine, so that in the last dose I ordered for him there were six grains. This quantity, which is perfectly safe to administer to the paralyzed frame of Monsieur Noirtier, which has become gradually accustomed to it, would be sufficient to kill another person. My dear doctor, there is no communication between Monsieur Noirtier's apartment and that of Madame de saint Meron, and Barrois never entered my mother-in-law's room. In short, doctor, although I know you to be the most conscientious man in the world, and although I place the utmost reliance on you, I want, notwithstanding my conviction, to believe this axiom, errare humanum est. 
Is there one of my brethren in whom you have equal confidence with myself? Why do you ask me that? What do you wish? Send for him. I will tell him what I have seen, and we will consult together and examine the body. And you will find traces of poison? No, I did not say of poison. But we can prove what was the state of the body. We shall discover the cause of her sudden death, and we shall say, dear Villefort, if this thing has been caused by negligence, watch over your servants. If from hatred, watch your enemies. What do you propose to me, Darvigny? said Villefort in despair. So soon as another is admitted into our secret, an inquest will become necessary, and an inquest in my house. Impossible. Still, continued the procureur, looking at the doctor with uneasiness. If you wish it, if you demand it, why, then it shall be done. But, doctor, you see me already so grieved. How can I introduce into my house so much scandal after so much sorrow? My wife and my daughter would die of it. And I, doctor, you know a man does not arrive at the post I occupy. One has not been king's attorney twenty-five years without having amassed a tolerable number of enemies. Mine are numerous. Let this affair be talked of. It will be a triumph for them, which will make them rejoice and cover me with shame. Pardon me, doctor, these worldly ideas. Were you a priest, I should not dare to tell you, but you are a man, and you know mankind. Doctor, pray recall your words. You have said nothing, have you? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor, my first duty is to humanity. I would have saved Madame de saint Meron if science could have done it, but she is dead, and my duty regards the living. Let us bury this terrible secret in the deepest recesses of our hearts. I am willing, if any one should suspect this, that my silence on the subject should be imputed to my ignorance. Meanwhile, sir, watch always. Watch carefully, for perhaps the evil may not stop here, and when you have found the culprit, if you find him, I will say to you, you are a magistrate. Do as you will. I thank you, doctor, said Villefort with indescribable joy. I never had a better friend than you. And as if he feared Dr. Daffrigny would recall his promise, he hurried him towards the house. When they were gone, Morel ventured out from under the trees, and the moon shone upon his face, which was so pale it might have been taken for that of a ghost. I am manifestly protected in a most wonderful but most terrible manner, said he. But Valentine, poor girl, how will she bear so much sorrow? As he thought thus, he looked alternately at the window with red curtains and the three windows with white curtains. The light had almost disappeared from the former. Doubtless Madame de Villefort had just put out her lamp, and the night lamp alone reflected its dull light on the window. At the extremity of the building, on the contrary, he saw one of the three windows open. A wax light placed on the mantelpiece threw some of its pale rays without, and a shadow was seen for one moment on the balcony. Morel shuddered. He thought he heard a sob. It cannot be wondered at that his mind, generally so courageous, but now disturbed by the two strongest human passions, love and fear, was weakened even to the indulgence of superstitious thoughts. Although it was impossible that Valentine should see him, hidden as he was, he thought he heard the shadow at the window call him. His disturbed mind told him so. This double error became an irresistible reality, and by one of the incomprehensible transports of youth he bounded from his hiding place, and with two strides, at the risk of being seen, at the risk of alarming Valentine, at the risk of being discovered by some exclamation which might escape the young girl, he crossed the flower garden, which by the light of the moon resembled a large white lake, and having passed the rows of orange trees which extended in front of the house, 
he reached the step, ran quickly up and pushed the door, which opened without offering any resistance. Valentine had not seen him. Her eyes raised towards heaven were watching a silvery cloud gliding over the Asia, its form that of a shadow mounting towards heaven. Her poetic and excited mind pictured it as the soul of her grandmother. Meanwhile, Morel had traversed the anteroom and found the staircase, which, being carpeted, prevented his approach being heard, and he had regained that degree of confidence that the presence of Monsieur de Villefort even would not have alarmed him. He was quite prepared for any such encounter. He would at once approach Valentine's father and acknowledge all, begging Villefort to pardon and sanction the love which united two fond and loving hearts. Morel was mad. Happily, he did not meet anyone. Now, especially, did he find the description Valentine had given of the interior of the house useful to him. He arrived safely at the top of the staircase, and while he was feeling his way, a sob indicated the direction he was to take. He turned back. A door, partly opened, enabled him to see his road and to hear the voice of one in sorrow. He pushed the door open and entered. At the other end of the room, under a white sheet which covered it, lay the corpse, still more alarming to Morel since the account he had so unexpectedly overheard. By its side, on her knees, and with her head buried in the cushion of an easy chair, was Valentine, trembling and sobbing, her hands extended above her head, clasped and stiff. She had turned from the window which remained open, and was praying in accents that would have affected the most unfeeling. Her words were rapid, incoherent, unintelligible, for the burning weight of grief almost stopped her utterance. The moon, shining through the open blinds, made the lamp appear to burn paler, and cast a sepulchral hue over the whole scene. Morel could not resist this. He was not exemplary for piety. He was not easily impressed. But Valentine's suffering, weeping, wringing her hands before him, was more than he could bear in silence. He sighed and whispered a name, and the head bathed in tears and pressed on the velvet cushion of the chair, a head like that of a Magdalene by Correggio, was raised and turned toward him. Valentine perceived him without betraying the least surprise. The heart overwhelmed with one great grief is insensible to minor emotions. Morel held out his hand to her. Valentine, as her only apology for not having met him, pointed to the corpse under the sheet and began to sob again. Neither dared for some time to speak in that room. They hesitated to break the silence which death seemed to impose. At length, Valentine ventured. "'My dear friend,' said she, "'how came you here? "'Alas, I would say you are welcome "'had not death opened the way for you into this house.' "'Valentine,' said Morel with a trembling voice, "'I had waited since half-past eight "'and did not see you come. "'I became uneasy, leapt the wall, "'found my way through the garden, "'when voices conversing about the fatal event. "'What voices?' asked Valentine. "'Morel shuddered as he thought of the conversation "'of the doctor and Monsieur de Villefort, "'and he thought he could see through the sheet "'the extended hands, the stiff neck.' and the purple lips. "'Your servants,' said he, "'who were repeating the whole of the sorrowful story. "'From them I learned it all. "'But it was risking the failure of our plan "'to come up here, love.' "'Forgive me,' replied Morel. "'I will go away.' "'No,' said Valentine. "'You might meet someone. "'Stay. "'But if anyone should come here?' "'The young girl shook her head. No one will come, said she. Do not fear. There is our safeguard, pointing to the bed. But what has become of Monsieur Depinay? replied Morel. Monsieur Franz arrived to sign the contract, just as my dear grandmother was dying. Alas, said Morel with a feeling of selfish joy, for he thought this death would cause the wedding to be postponed indefinitely. 
But what redoubles my sorrow? continued the young girl, as if this feeling was to receive its immediate punishment. Is that the poor old lady on her deathbed requested that the marriage might take place as soon as possible. She also, thinking to protect me, was acting against me. Hark, said Morel. They both listened. Steps were distinctly heard in the corridor and on the stairs. It is my father, who has just left his study. To accompany the doctor to the door, added Morel. How did you know it is the doctor? asked Valentine, astonished. I imagined it must be, said Morel. Valentine looked at the young man. They heard the street door close. Then Monsieur de Villefort locked the garden door and returned upstairs. He stopped a moment in the anteroom, as if hesitating whether to turn to his own apartment or into Madame de saint Méran's. Morel concealed himself behind a door. Valentine remained motionless, grief seeming to deprive her of all fear. Monsieur de Villefort passed on to his own room. Now, said Valentine, you can neither go out by the front door nor by the garden. Morel looked at her with astonishment. There is but one way left that is safe, she said. It is through my grandfather's room. She rose. Come, she added. Where? asked Maximilian. To my grandfather's room. I? In Monsieur Noirtier's apartment? Yes. Can you mean it, Valentine? I have long wished it. He is my only remaining friend, and we both need his help. Come. Be careful, Valentine, said Morel, hesitating to comply with the young girl's wishes. I now see my error. I acted like a madman in coming here. Are you sure you're more reasonable? Yes, said Valentine. And I have but one scruple, that of leaving my dear grandmother's remains, which I had undertaken to watch. Valentine, said Morel, death is in itself sacred. Yes, said Valentine. Besides, it will not be for long. She then crossed the corridor and led the way down a narrow staircase to Monsieur Noirtier's room. Morel followed her on tiptoe. At the door they found the old servant. Barois said Valentine. Shut the door and let no one come in. She passed first. Noirtier, seated in his chair and listening to every sound, was watching the door. He saw Valentine and his eye brightened. There was something grave and solemn in the approach of the young girl which struck the old man, and immediately his bright eye began to interrogate. Dear grandfather, said she hurriedly, you know poor grandmama died an hour since. And now I have no friend in the world but you. His expressive eyes evinced the greatest tenderness. To you alone, then, may I confide my sorrows and my hopes. The paralytic motioned, yes. Valentine took Maximilian's hand. Look attentively, then, at this gentleman. The old man fixed his scrutinizing gaze with slight astonishment on Morel. It is Monsieur Maximilian Morel, said she the son of that good merchant of Marseilles, whom you doubtless recollect. Yes, said the old man. He brings an irreproachable name, which Maximilian is likely to render glorious, since at thirty years of age he is a captain, an officer of the Legion of Honour. The old man signified that he recollected him. Well, grandpapa, said Valentine, kneeling before him and pointing to Maximilian. I love him and will be only his. Were I compelled to marry another, I would destroy myself. The eyes of the paralytic expressed a multitude of tumultuous thoughts. You like Monsieur Maximilien Morel, do you not, Grandpapa? asked Valentine. Yes. And you will protect us, who are your children, against the will of my father. Noirtier cast an intelligent glance at Morel as if to say, Perhaps I may. Maximilian understood him. Mademoiselle, said he, you have a sacred duty to fulfill in your deceased grandmother's room. Will you allow me the honour of a few minutes' conversation with Monsieur Droitier? That is it, said the old man's eye. Then he looked anxiously at Valentine. Do you fear you will not understand? 
Yes. Oh, we have so often spoken of you, that he knows exactly how I talk to you. Then turning to Maximilian with an adorable smile, although shaded by sorrow. He knows everything I know, said she. Valentina rose, placed a chair for Morel, requested Barois not to admit anyone, and having tenderly embraced her grandfather and sorrowfully taken leave of Morel, she went away. To prove to Noirtier that he was in Valentine's confidence and knew all their secrets, Morel took the dictionary, a pen and some paper, and placed them all on a table where there was a light. But first, said Morel, allow me, sir, to tell you who I am, how much I love Mademoiselle Valentine, and what are my designs respecting her. Noirtier made a sign that he would listen. It was an imposing sight to witness this old man, apparently a mere useless burden, becoming the sole protector, support, and adviser of the lovers who were both young, beautiful, and strong. His remarkably noble and austere expression struck Morel, who began his story with trembling. He related the manner in which he had become acquainted with Valentine, and how he had loved her, and that Valentine, in her solitude and her misfortune, had accepted the offer of his devotion. He told him his birth, his position, his fortune, and more than once, when he consulted the look of the paralytic, that look answered, That is good. Proceed. And now, said Morel, when he had finished the first part of his recital, now I have told you of my love and my hopes, may I inform you of my intentions? Yes, signified the old man. This was our resolution. A cabriolet was in waiting at the gate in which I intended to carry off Valentine to my sister's house, to marry her, and to wait respectfully Monsieur de Villefort's pardon. No, said Noirtier. We must not do so? No. You do not sanction our project? No. There is no other way, said Morel. The old man's interrogative eye said, What? I will go, continued Maximilian. I will seek Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. I am happy to be able to mention this in Mademoiselle de Villefort's absence, and will conduct myself toward him so as to compel him to challenge me. Noirtier's look continued to interrogate. You wish to know what I will do? Yes. I will find him as I told you. I will tell him the ties which bind me to Mademoiselle Valentine. If he be a sensible man, he will prove it by renouncing of his own accord the hand of his betrothed, and will secure my friendship and love until death. If he refuse, either through interest or ridiculous pride, after I have proved to him that he would be forcing my wife from me, that Valentine loves me and will have no other, I will fight him, give him every advantage, and I shall kill him, or he will kill me. If I am victorious, I will not marry Valentine, and if I die, I am very sure Valentine will not marry him. Noirtier watched with indescribable pleasure this noble and sincere countenance on which every sentiment his tongue uttered was depicted, adding by the expression of his fine features all that colouring adds to a sound and faithful drawing. Still, when Morel had finished, he shut his eyes several times, which was his manner of saying, No. No, said Morel. You disapprove of this second project, as you did of the first? I do, signified the old man. But what then must be done? asked Morel. Madame de Saint Méran's last request was that the marriage might not be delayed. Must I let things take their course? Noirtier did not move. I understand, said Morel. I am to wait. Yes. But delay may ruin our plan, sir, replied the young man. Alone, Valentine has no power. She will be compelled to submit. I am here almost miraculously, and can scarcely hope for so good an opportunity to occur again. Believe me, there are only the two plans I have proposed to you. Forgive my vanity, and tell me which you prefer. Do you authorize Mademoiselle Valentine to entrust herself to my honor? No. Do you prefer I seek out Monsieur Depinay? No. Whence, then, will you come the help we need, from chance? 
resumed Morel. No. From you? Yes. You thoroughly understand me, sir. Pardon my eagerness for my life depends on your answer. Will our help come from you? Yes. You are sure of it? Yes. There was so much firmness in the look which gave this answer. No one could at any rate doubt his will, if they did his power. Oh, thank you a thousand times. But how? Unless a miracle should restore your speech, your gesture, your movement. How can you, chained to that armchair, dumb and motionless, oppose this marriage? A smile lit up the old man's face. A strange smile of the eyes in a paralyzed face. Then I must wait, asked the young man. Yes. But the contract? The same smile returned. Will you assure me it shall not be signed? Yes, said Noirtier. The contract shall not be signed, cried Morel. Oh, pardon me, sir. I can scarcely realize so great a happiness. Will they not sign it? No, said the paralytic. Notwithstanding that assurance, Morel still hesitated. This promise of an impotent old man was so strange that, instead of being the result of the power of his will, it might emanate from enfeebled organs. Is it not natural that the madman, ignorant of his folly, should attempt things beyond his power? The weak man talks of burdens he can raise, the timid of giants he can confront, the poor of treasures he spends, the most humble peasant in the height of his pride calls himself Jupiter. Whether Noirtier understood the young man's indecision, or whether he had not full confidence in his docility, he looked uneasily at him. "'What do you wish, sir?' asked Morel. "'That I should renew my promise of remaining tranquil.' Noirtier's eyes remained fixed and firm, as if to imply that a promise did not suffice. Then it passed from his face to his hands. "'Shall I swear to you, sir?' asked Maximilian. "'Yes,' said the paralytic with the same solemnity. Morel understood that the old man attached great importance to an oath. He extended his hand. "'I swear to you on my honour," said he, "'to await your decision respecting the course I am to pursue with Monsieur d'Epinay.' "'That is right,' said the old man. "'Now,' said Morel, "'do you wish me to retire?' "'Yes.' "'Without seeing Mademoiselle Valentine?' "'Yes.' Morel made a sign that he was ready to obey. "'But,' said he, "'first allow me to embrace you as your daughter did just now.' Noirtier's expression could not be understood. The young man pressed his lips on the same spot, on the old man's forehead where Valentine's had been. Then he bowed a second time and retired. He found outside the door the old servant to whom Valentine had given directions. Morel was conducted along a dark passage, which led to a little door opening on the garden. Soon found the spot where he had entered, with the assistance of the shrubs gained the top of the wall, and by his ladder was in an instant in the clover field, where his cabriolet was still waiting for him. He got in it, and thoroughly wearied by so many emotions, arrived about midnight in the Rue Melee, threw himself on his bed, and slept soundly. End of chapter 73。Chapter 74 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 74 The Villefort Family Vault. Two days after, a considerable crowd was assembled, towards ten o'clock in the morning, around the door of Monsieur de Villefort's house, and the long file of mourning coaches and private carriages extended along the Faubourg Saint-Honoré and the Rue de la Papinière. Among them was one of a very singular form, which appeared to have come from a distance. It was a kind of covered wagon, painted black, and was one of the first to arrive. Inquiry was made, and it was ascertained that, by a strange coincidence, this carriage contained the corpse of the Marquis de saint Meron, 
and that those who had come thinking to attend one funeral would follow two. Their number was great. The Marquis de saint Meran was one of the most zealous and faithful dignitaries of Louis XVIII and King Charles X, had preserved a great number of friends, and these added to the personages whom the usages of society gave Villefort a claim on, formed a considerable body. Due information was given to the authorities, and permission obtained that the two funerals should take place at the same time. A second hearse, decked with the same funereal pomp, was brought to Monsieur de Villefort's door, and the coffin removed into it from the post-wagon. The two bodies were to be interred in the cemetery of Père Lachaise, where Monsieur de Villefort had long since had a tomb prepared for the reception of his family. The remains of poor René were already deposited there, and now, after ten years of separation, her father and mother were to be reunited with her. The Parisians, always curious, always affected by funereal display, looked on with religious silence, while the splendid procession accompanied to their last abode two of the number of the old aristocracy, the greatest protectors of commerce and sincere devotees to their principles. In one of the morning coaches, Beauchamp, Debray, and Chateau Renault were talking of the very sudden death of the Marchioness. I saw Madame de saint Meron only last year at Marseille when I was coming back from Algiers, said Chateau Renault. She looked like a woman destined to live to be a hundred years old from her apparent sound health and great activity of mind and body. How old was she? France assured me, replied Albert, that she was sixty-six years old. But she has not died of old age, but of grief. It appears that since the death of the Marquis, which affected her very deeply, she has not completely recovered her reason. But of what disease then did she die? asked de Bray. It is said to have been a congestion of the brain, or apoplexy, which is the same thing, is it not? Nearly. It is difficult to believe that it was apoplexy, said Beauchamp. Madame de saint Meran, whom I once saw was short, of slender form, and of a much more nervous than sanguine temperament. Grief could hardly produce apoplexy in such a constitution as that of Madame de saint Meran. At any rate, said Albert, whatever disease or doctor may have killed her, Monsieur de Villefort, or rather Mademoiselle Valentine, or still rather our friend France, inherits a magnificent fortune, amounting, I believe, to eighty thousand livres per annum. And this fortune will be doubled at the death of the old Jacobin Noirtier. This is a tenacious old grandfather, said Beauchamp. Tenacem probositi verum. I think he must have made an agreement with death to outlive all his heirs, and he appears likely to succeed. He resembles the old conventionalist of ninety-three, who said to Napoleon in 1814, You bend because your empire is a young stem, weakened by rapid growth. Take the Republic for a tutor. Let us return with renewed strength to the battlefield, and I promise you five hundred thousand soldiers, another Marengo, and a second Austerlitz. Ideas do not become extinct, sire. They slumber sometimes, but only revive the stronger before they sleep entirely. Ideas and men appear the same to him. On one thing only it puzzles me, namely how France d'Epinay will like a grandfather who cannot be separated from his wife. But where is France? In the first carriage with Monsieur de Villefort, who considered him already as one of the family. Such was the conversation in almost all the carriages. These two sudden deaths, so quickly following each other, astonished everyone. But no one suspected the terrible secret which M. d'Averigny had communicated in his nocturnal walk to M. de Villefort. They arrived in about an hour at the cemetery. The weather was mild, but dull, and in harmony with the funeral ceremony. Among the groups, 
which flocked towards the family vault. Chateau Renault recognised Morel, who had come alone in a cabriolet, and walked silently along the path or bordered with yew trees. "'You here?' said Chateau Renault, passing his arms through the young captains. "'Are you a friend of Villefort's? How is it that I have never met you at his house?' "'I am no acquaintance of Monsieur de Villefort's,' answered Morel. "'But I was of Madame de saint Méran. Albert came up to them at this moment with France. "'The time and place are but ill-suited for an introduction,' said Albert. "'But we are not superstitious, Monsieur Morel. "'Allow me to present to you Monsieur Franz Depinay, "'a delightful travelling companion with whom I made the tour of Italy. "'My dear Franz, Monsieur Maximilian Morel, "'an excellent friend I have acquired in your absence, "'and whose name you will hear me mention every time I make an allusion to affection, wit, or amiability.' "'Morel hesitated for a moment.' He feared it would be hypocritical to accost in a friendly manner the man whom he was tacitly opposing, but his oath and the gravity of the circumstances recurred to his memory. He struggled to conceal his emotion and bowed to France. Mademoiselle de Villefort is in deep sorrow, is she not? said de Bray to France. Extremely, replied he. She looks so pale this morning, I scarcely knew her. These apparently simple words pierced Morel to the heart. This man had seen Valentine and spoken to her. The young and high-spirited officer required all his strength of mind to resist breaking his oath. He took the arm of Chateau Renaud and turned towards the vault, where the attendants had already placed the two coffins. "'This is a magnificent habitation,' said Beauchamp, looking towards the mausoleum. "'A summer and winter palace,' You will in turn enter it, my dear Epide, for you will soon be numbered as one of the family. I, as a philosopher, should like a little country house, a cottage down there under the trees, without so many free stones over my poor body. In dying, I will say to those around me what Voltaire wrote to Piron, Eorus, and all will be over. But come, Franz, take courage. Your wife is an heiress. Indeed, Beauchamp, you are unbearable. Politics has made you laugh at everything, and political men have made you disbelieve everything. But when you have the honour of associating with ordinary men, and the pleasure of leaving politics for a moment, try to find your affectionate heart, which you leave with your stick when you go to the chamber. But tell me, said Beauchamp, what is life? Is it not a hall in death's anteroom? I am prejudiced against Beauchamp, said Albert, drawing France away and leaving the former to finish his philosophical dissertation with Debray. The Villefort vault formed a square of white stones about twenty feet high. An interior partition separated the two families, and each apartment had its entrance door. Here were not, as in other tombs, ignoble drawers one above another, where thrift bestows its dead and labels them like specimens in a museum. All that was visible within the bronze gates was a gloomy-looking room, separated by a wall from the vault itself. The two doors before mentioned were in the middle of this wall, and enclosed the Villefort and saint Méran coffins. Their grief might freely expend itself, without being disturbed, by the trifling loungers who came from a picnic party to visit Père Lachaise, or by lovers who made it their rendezvous. The two coffins were placed on trestles previously prepared to their reception in the right-hand crypt belonging to the saint Méran family. Villefort, France, and a few near relatives alone entered the sanctuary. As the religious ceremonies had all been performed at the door, and there was no address given, the party all separated. Chateau Renaud, Albert and Morel went one way, and Debray and Beauchamp the other. France remained with Monsieur de Villefort at the gate of the cemetery. Morel made an excuse to wait. He saw France and Monsieur de Villefort get into the same mourning coach, and thought this meeting foreboded evil. 
he then returned to Paris, and although in the same carriage with Chateau Renaud and Albert, he did not hear one word of their conversation. As France was about to take leave of Monsieur de Villefort, "'When shall I see you again?' said the latter. "'At what time you please, sir,' replied Franz. "'As soon as possible.' "'I am at your command, sir. Shall we return together? "'If not unpleasant to you?' "'On the contrary, I shall feel much pleasure.' <laughs> Thus the future father and son-in-law stepped into the same carriage, and Borel, seeing them pass, became uneasy. Villefort and Franz returned to the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, the procureur, without going to see either his wife or his daughter, went at once to his study, and offering the young man a chair. "'Monsieur Depinay, said he, "'allow me to remind you at this moment, which is perhaps not so ill-chosen as at first sight may appear, for obedience to the wishes of the departed is the first offering which should be made at their tomb.' Allow me then to remind you of the wish expressed by Madame de Saint-Méran on her deathbed, that Valentine's wedding might not be deferred. You know the affairs of the deceased are in perfect order, and her will bequeaths to Valentine the entire property of the Saint-Méran family. The notary showed me the documents yesterday, which will enable us to draw up the contract immediately. You may call on the notary... Monsieur Deschamps, Place Beauvau, Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and you have my authority to inspect those deeds. Sir, replied Monsieur Depinay, it is not perhaps the moment for Mademoiselle Valentine, who is in deep distress, to think of her husband. Indeed, I fear, Valentine will have no greater pleasure than that of fulfilling her grandmother's last injunctions. There will be no obstacle from that quarter. I assure you. In that case, replied Franz, as I shall raise none, you may make arrangements when you please. I have pledged my word, and shall feel pleasure and happiness in adhering to it. Then, said Villefort, nothing further is required. The contract was to have been signed three days since. We shall find it all ready and can sign it today. But the morning, said Franz, hesitating. Don't be uneasy on that score, replied Villefort. No ceremony will be neglected in my house. Mademoiselle de Villefort may retire during the prescribed three months to her estate of saint méran I say hers, for she inherits it today. There, after a few days, if you like, the civil marriage shall be celebrated without pomp or ceremony. Madame de Saint-Méran wished her daughter should be married there. When that is over, you, sir, can return to Paris, while your wife passes the time of her mourning with her mother-in-law. As you please, sir, said Franz. Then, replied Monsieur de Villefort, have the kindness to wait half an hour. Valentine shall come down into the drawing-room. I will send Monsieur Deschamps, we will read, and sign the contract before we separate. And this evening, Madame de Villefort shall accompany Valentine to her estate, where we will rejoin them in a week. Sir, said Franz, I have one request to make. What is it? I wish Albert de Morcerf and Raoul de Chateauneau to be present at this signature. You know they are my witnesses. Half an hour will suffice to apprise them. Will you go for them yourself? Or shall you send? I prefer going, sir. I shall expect you then in half an hour, Baron, and Valentine will be ready. Franz bowed and left the room. Scarcely had the door closed when Monsieur de Villefort sent to tell Valentine to be ready in the drawing room in half an hour, as he expected the notary and Monsieur d'Epinay and his witnesses. The news caused a great sensation throughout the house. Madame de Villefort would not believe it, and Valentine was thunderstruck. She looked around for help, and would have gone down to her grandfather's room, but on the stairs she met Monsieur de Villefort, who took her arm and led her into the drawing-room. In the ante-room, 
Valentine met Barrois and looked despairingly at the old servant. A moment later, Madame de Villefort entered the drawing-room with her little Edward. It was evident that she had shared the grief of the family, for she was pale and looked fatigued. She sat down, took Edward on her knees, and from time to time pressed this child, on whom her affections appeared centred, almost convulsively to her bosom. Two carriages were soon heard to enter the courtyard. One was the notary's, the other that of Franz and his friends. In a moment the whole party was assembled. Valentine was so pale one might trace the blue veins from her temples, round her eyes and down her cheeks. Franz was deeply affected. Chateau Renaud and Albert looked at each other with amazement. The ceremony which was just concluded had not appeared more sorrowful than did that which was about to begin. Madame de Villefort had placed herself in the shadow behind a velvet curtain, and as she constantly bent over her child, it was difficult to read the expression of her face. Monsieur de Villefort was, as usual, unmoved. The notary, after having, according to the customary method, arranged the papers on the table, taken his place in an armchair, and raised his spectacles, turned towards France. "'Are you Monsieur Franz de Quinel, Baron d'Epinay?' asked he, although he knew it perfectly. "'Yes, sir,' replied Franz. The notary bowed. "'I have then to inform you, sir, at the request of Monsieur de Villefort, that your projected marriage with Mademoiselle de Villefort has changed the feeling of Monsieur Noirtier towards his grandchild, and that he disinherits her entirely of the fortune he would have left her. Let me hasten to add, continued he, that the testator, having only the right to alienate a part of his fortune, and having alienated it all, the will will not bear scrutiny and is declared null and void. Yes, said Villefort. But I warn M. d'Epinay that during my lifetime my father's will shall never be questioned, my position forbidding any doubt to be entertained. Sir, said Franz, I regret much that such a question has been raised in the presence of Mademoiselle Valentine. I have never inquired the amount of her fortune, which, however limited it may be, exceeds mine. My family has sought consideration in this alliance with Monsieur de Villefort. All I seek is happiness. Valentine imperceptibly thanked him, while two silent tears rolled down her cheeks. Besides, sir, said Villefort, addressing himself to his future son-in-law, accepting the loss of a portion of your hopes, this unexpected will not need to personally wound you. Monsieur Noirtier's weakness of mind sufficiently explains it. It is not because Mademoiselle de Valentine is going to marry you that he is angry, but because she will marry. A union with any other would have caused him the same sorrow. Old age is selfish, sir, and Mademoiselle de Villefort has been a faithful companion to Monsieur Noirtier, which she cannot be when she becomes the Baroness de Pinay. My father's melancholy state prevents our speaking to him on any subjects which the weakness of his mind would incapacitate him from understanding, and I am perfectly convinced that at the present time, although he knows that his granddaughter is going to be married, Monsieur Noirtier has ever forgotten the name of his intended grandson. Monsieur de Villefort had scarcely said this when the door opened and Barrois appeared. Gentlemen, said he in a tone strangely firm for a servant speaking to his masters under such solemn circumstances. Gentlemen, Monsieur Noirtier de Villefort wishes to speak immediately to Monsieur Franz de Quenel Baron d'Epinay. He, as well as the notary that there might be no mistake in the person, gave all his titles to the bridegroom elect. Villefort started. Madame de Villefort let her son slip from her knees. Valentine rose, pale 
and dumb as a statue. Albert and Chateau Renault exchanged a second look, more full of amazement than the first. The notary looked at Villefort. It is impossible, said the procureur. Monsieur d'Epinay cannot leave the drawing room at present. It is at this moment, replied Barrois with the same firmness, that Monsieur Noirtier, my master, wishes to speak on important subjects to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. Grandpapa Noirtier can speak now, then, said Edward with his habitual quickness. However, his remark did not make Madame de Villefort even smile. So much was every mind engaged, and so solemn was the situation. Astonishment was at its height. Something like a smile was perceptible on Madame de Villefort's countenance. Valentine instinctively raised her eyes, as if to thank heaven. "'Pray go, Valentine,' said Monsieur de Villefort and see what this new fancy of your grandfather's is. Valentine rose quickly, and was hastening joyfully towards the door, when Monsieur de Villefort altered his intention. Stop, said he, I will go with you. Excuse me, sir, said Franz. Since Monsieur Noirtier sent for me, I am ready to attend to his wish. Besides, I shall be happy to pay my respects to him not having yet had the honour of doing so. "'Pray, sir,' said Villefort, with marked uneasiness, "'do not disturb yourself.' "'Forgive me, sir,' said Franz, in a resolute tone. "'I would not lose this opportunity of proving to Monsieur Noirtier how wrong it would be of him to encourage feelings of dislike to me, which I am determined to conquer, whatever they may be, by my devotion.' and without listening to Villefort, he arose and followed Valentine, who was running downstairs with the joy of a shipwrecked mariner who finds a rock to cling to. Monsieur de Villefort followed them. Chateau Renault and Morcerf exchanged a third look of still increasing wonder. End of chapter 74